Good. Good afternoon. I'm Councilman Mark Jonai, Chair of the City Council's Committee on Small Business, and I'd like to welcome you to today's hearing on digital food delivery apps and the impact that they are having on local restaurants and the food industry. Food delivery apps are estimated to be upwards of a $200 billion market in the U.S. and have dramatically changed the way customers place food orders and interact with local restaurants. Small businesses play a vital role in New York City's economy. According to the SBS, there are about 196,000 businesses in New York City that employ less than 20 employees, many of those are food establishments. According to the city's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, there are approximately 27,000 restaurants in New York City. There are a number of factors that impact a restaurant's chance of succeeding, some within their control, such as food quality and customer service, and then there are some factors that are not within the control, such as the economy, food and labor costs, and government regulation, which many would argue is over-regulation. We live in an un we live in an on-demand and instant gratification world, and we have become accustomed to communicating and shopping with a click of a button, from tweeting, emails, texting, car service, grocery, video streaming, and meals. Everything can be accomplished instantaneously without directly communicating with other human beings or leaving the comfort of one's home. The restaurant industry is not different. It has been sp spared from the consumer trend of ultra convenience. And in fact, it changed the entire business model for businesses that rely on foot traffic. While food delivery has always been part of the restaurant business, it has tremendously grown and become much more significant to a restaurant's business. I have no indicators or information that consumers are necessarily ordering delivery at higher rates. Instead, the form in which they can place a delivery has evolved and become much more appealing to the consumers of this era. Placing orders via phone are now prehistoric, something that only old people like myself do. According to a recent survey from Wells Fargo, 46% of surveyed participants ordered food through apps, 32% called into the restaurant, and 19% placed their orders using a computer. By far, the fastest growing channel for food delivery is the use of delivery apps. Brands such as Uber Eats, DoorDash, Grubhub, known as Seamless in New York City, and Postmates have made it easy for customers to pick up their phone, scan through menus, and have access to a large variety of food establishments that can deliver directly to the door. According to a UBS forecast, online food ordering may rise by more than 20% each year to reach $365 billion by the year 2030. Morgan Stanley analysis forecast deliveries could eventually reach 40% of restaurant sales, making it close to the most significant factor in whether or not a restaurant succeeds or fails. At its most ideal, this could be a relationship of convenience that works for all stakeholders. Restaurants get a steady stream of new customers without having to develop and manage an expensive digital platform. Consumers get the convenience, diversity, and efficiency they crave, and the third-party platforms are given their fair compensation for the service they provide. On the opposite end, there's a concern that it could be a system where restaurant owners are trapped in an unstable, unsustainable business model that not only doesn't add to their bottom line, but could actually eat away at their profits and their ability to keep their doors open. As the digital food delivery market has grown, stakeholders are starting to grapple with major issues such as fees and commissions exceeding actual profits. Privacy concerns with collected data and the possible exploitation of undocumented workers. These are just some of the issues that we're going to be going to explore today. As chair of this committee, I've had the opportunity to meet with several stakeholders and understand their perspectives and concerns. Today's hearing is an opportunity to learn more from the stakeholders on the record so that this body may consider what, if anything, should be done to optimize the business environment for all parties and or remove any unfair practices that might cause harm to the city's restaurant industry. We approach this hearing with an open mind and no preset agenda. 
I and the other members of the committee will have fair but pointed questions as we seek to determine if there's a need for regulation or legislation solutions. With that said, I'd like to thank my Chief of Staff, Reggie Johnson, and Legislative Counsel to the Small Business Committee, Irene, for all their hard work in preparing for this hearing. I now welcome Jackie Malone and Steve Pecker. Steve Pecker from the City Small Business Services to lead off uh, our first panel. Uh, will you please swear in uh, our panel so that we can deliver the opening remarks? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and ans answer honestly to council members' questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Good to go? Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Joe and I, and members of the Committee on Small Business. My name is Jackie Mallon, and I am the first Deputy Commissioner at the New York City Department of Small Business Services. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. I'm joined by my colleague, Stephen Picker, the Executive Director of our Food Service Industry Partnership. Restaurants are a critical component of New York City's small business community. New York City is home to over 20,000 restaurants and they employ over 270,000 New Yorkers. The landscape of this industry is continually evolving and SBS aims to help business owners be nimble in adapting to changing market conditions. To assist restaurant owners, SBS offers many resources that help them start, operate, and grow. Our services to support restaurants include our government navigation and compliance advisory services, which help restaurant owners navigate the regulatory process and ensure that they are in compliance with the regulations necessary to maintain public health and safety. To date, compliance, compliance advisors have provided more than 2,600 on-site consultations for restaurants, helping these businesses avoid common violations before their inspections. We also help restaurant owners access capital, hire new employees, and fund employee training through our NYC Business Solutions Centers. On an average annual basis, SBS helps open roughly 500 restaurants, fill nearly 3,000 open positions at restaurants, and connect about 100 restaurants to around $4 million in financing. To help neighborhood businesses thrive in their communities, SBS provides eligible business owners with legal services on topics including lease negotiations, formalizing oral lease agreements, and landlord harassment through our commercial lease assistance program. Of the more than 300 businesses served through the program, more than 25% are accommodation and food service establishments. I have the big font, so it takes more pages. Um, to help neighborhood businesses adapt to changing market condition, SBS runs the Love Your Local Grant Program. To date, we've awarded grant funding to 40 small businesses, including many restaurants. Through Love Your Local, SBS is aiming to identify common challenges that are impacting the profitability of small businesses so that we can develop and test new business services to support the growth and retention of longstanding businesses across the five boroughs. SBS also works directly with the restaurant industry through our NYC Food and Beverage Industry Partnership, which is made up of over 30 New York City restaurant industry leaders, key professional associations, and community-based organizations that focus on skills training. The partnership allows us to work directly with the industry on priority issues impacting both employers and workers to support the growth of the sector. Key priorities include helping restaurants navigate the regulatory environment, addressing the demand for skilled workers, and providing support to adapt to the rising cost of doing business in the city. Of the major challenges elevated by the industry, members of the partnership cited the recruitment of skilled employees as one of the most important. After executing a pilot last year, SPS has refined our line cook apprenticeship program, now called First Course NYC, to further incorporate employer feedback and enhance pre-apprenticeship training. Our industry partners have also raised concerns about the cost of utilizing delivery service applications and their impact on profit margins. However, many have also reported the positive impact these platforms can have on their business in terms of driving volume of delivery orders. The increasing consumer adoption and cost of these applications are changing market conditions for restaurants. SPS is committed to working with industry and the council to examine solutions and services that will assist restaurants in adapting to these new technologies and patterns of, of consumer behavior. We know that's a complicated issue and we look forward to learning more from our industry partners and continuing this conversation uh, with the city council. Thank you very much and I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. Thank you, uh, First Deputy. Um, of the New York City Food and Beverage Industry Partnership, you have over 30 restaurant industry leaders mm -hmm. that you work with. Has How much of the online uh, providers' uh, issues 
have been brought to your attention? As I said in testimony, I, I, many have said like this is a thing that's impacting our, our profit margin. It's, it's lowering it in some cases. And others have said, this is great because I'm getting a lot more volume than, than I would have you know, before. Um, so it's sort of a mixed bag and we're trying to learn more and try to really get under and understand how we might be of help. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything as you. Yeah, I think they absolutely feel like it's a it's a concern as as are all the concerns, the rising costs coming from all directions at this point in time. Um, so we're having conversations daily, weekly about how we might be of help to help them to figure out best ways forward in the new landscape. Um, so there's a lot of conversations being had. During those conversations, are you at liberty to share with us any of the issues that were brought up and suggestions that you may have come up collectively? And I want to reiterate and emphasize the importance of hearings like this. It actually allows us to have a better understanding sure. from all parties. Absolutely. Uh, we don't know what's best. And these hearings allow us to learn more and determine what steps we should take, if any at all. So with that in mind, during those conversations, can you think of uh, any issues that were raised that you actually came up with suggestions? You want me to start and if you, you like, want to sure. fill in? I mean, we've talked about a number of, of different things. You know, perhaps um, just like with commercial leasing, education um, would be helpful in terms of really understanding um, the, the, the terms of, of the agreements with the, the uh, delivery providers and the, the actual impact. I mean, it's certainly um, pretty obvious that there's a lot of potential to get a lot more orders, but understanding how that impacts your actual bottom line is maybe a, a, there's an opportunity to do some education there. There has been a little bit of discussion around the potential to f help to support the development of, of um, an app that the industry would sort of um, develop on their own and, and operate. That that has been like sort of a discussion. All of the, all of these things are sort of very early stage. I mean, would you? Is there? Yeah. No. The the issue tends to be that that everybody adopted these electronic models and techn technolo technological models because they were the way of the future. And now the future is here. And the because of many of these apps. Um, impact on the market, they are the best options for restaurants to reach their consumers in that arena. And so restaurants obviously don't want to give that up. On the flip side, it's costing money and, and impacting their bottom line. So they're just trying to find a way to balance that out. So it's two issues that you brought up that resonate with me. One, so the legal services that you offer, mm -hmm. um, the agreements that are made with these providers, is this something that you are now looking at perhaps that you can help our restaurants better understand the terms and conditions and what they're signing up for? Exactly, and and help in terms of how to project uh, what the bottom line's uh, gonna be. And how, that, that's an idea that's in, in progress. We're, we're thinking so about which that. leads to the next question. Yep. Your understanding of the profits of restaurants, and obviously there's a huge range between uh, fine dining and the sort of uh, dining, whether it be, uh, I'll use French restaurant where the costs are much higher and an Italian restaurant where the cost of food production is much lower. I mean, comparison, not that Italian food is less. <laughs> I love Italian food for the record. Uh, and I'm not promoting any one fine dining over another. <laughs> That's all wonderful. Um, what is the profits that are customary in the food industry. You want it? Sure. That that can really literally range anywhere from two percent to, I mean, the, the old model used to be ten to twelve percent, and you were solid and happy. And now, um, I would say that has tended to go down to somewhere to six, seven, eight percent if you're really lucky. You, and you're talking just to be, you're talking about full service restaurants, right? Full service yeah, restaurants, correct. Clear. So so as far as a range. Two to eight? On full service restaurants, two to eight percent. Um, and is that because of the regulations, the fines and the fees, <laughs> the real estate taxes, water and sewer rates, and everything else that has undermined the profitability of these restaurants? Don't answer that question. We'll come back to, to you at a later date. Thank Excellent. you. Can't help myself occasionally. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> so based on that model, what is the average cost that the online providers are charging for percentage fee to these restaurants that are uh, partaking in their um, program? I mean, I, I we don't know from like a big da database that we've looked at because we don't have that. I, I can simply just say to you what, what uh, restaurateurs have reported to us. Mm -hmm. And I think they said anywhere between um, uh, 10 and 30 percent, mm -hmm. right? As has been reported to us, right. but no way of verifying that. J just using, and again, we're going to get into the thick of it later on when we actually have the restaurants come up and we have a better understanding. But I don't know how to. I believe I know how to do math. <laughs> um, if you just explain that in fine dining, the average is from six to ten percent. Is that the average we're going to use? A little lower, but we can go with that. Okay, we'll use six to ten percent. <laughs> And the cost of the percentages paid to these providers was what again? 10 to 30. But isn't that a net loss? It's not 10 or 30 percent of their profit. You, you asked about what the, what the cost was. 10 to 30 percent of their delivery. Yeah. No, no, I'm sorry. I was asking profit. So typically, and the way I understood it always, um, was brought to my attention that restaurants operated anywhere from 12 to 24 percent, depending on the establishment, was their profit on the food serve the food that they served. Am I correct here, or you're not aware? I, I would say no. What would you say the profit is on a restaurant serve? serving I, their favorite dish? I would say what I said, at at max, currently 10 percent. 10 percent. Max. Max. And the online providers are charging anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of deliveries. Delivery sales, not overall right. sales. Just no, the, delivery sales. So, on yeah. that product, my favorite penny ala vodka dish <laughs> is coming from, I don't know, Reggie's restaurant. <laughs> Reggie's making 10 percent profit on that order when I order myself directly for him, from him. Yeah. We not understand each other. It's not apples and uh, you're mixing apples and oranges. I think. Ten, ten, There's an industry standard, right? Of yep. profitability. Of net profit. Of and, net profit. And the ten to thirty percent is on delivery sales. No, I'm asking of net profit. I, I don't so, think we know that. Yeah, I, you're. Well, we'll learn that quick. They only take a few. There's a standard that everything operates on. You know, whether it be any industry out there has a return on investment. This is what you expect to make if you did X sales a week. X should, Y should be your profit. Correct. And that is a range. Mm -hmm. What is that range as you know it, if you even know it? I'm going to go back to my 8 to 10%. So then we are talking about the same thing here. So restaurants are making 8 to 10% profit. Mm -hmm. Net profit. On their... Operation. To, op, on net, on gross sales. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. Okay, good. So now we're on the same page. Gross sales, 10% profit. What are the apps charging for an order? The 10 to 30%. What, that's what they're oh. reporting to us. Yeah. So then we are talking about the same thing. Okay. If a restaurant makes 10% on gross sales profit, a provider is charging anywhere from 10 to 30% for that same product, that product will yield a net loss that is or break even. Sales and and in in person sales are at the same profit margin. Just to be fair, I mean, I, I don't think that we're, you're going to be able to get from us like a, a specific answer to your question, right? That's that's where, how we're differing. We're saying they are reporting to us to 10 to 30 percent of the is they're, they're being charged on the delivery sales, which is a component of their overall sales, and the margin rates on their delivery sales may be different than their come and sit down in my restaurant sales, right? Right? Correct. And that's why we're, we're like not, can't uh, come to the exact same conclusion that you're coming to, which is like, do the math, they're losing money. Yeah. That, is that clear to us? We're not sure. Deputy, around the corner yeah. is, I think it's Italy Pizza. 
and they sell a pie. Yeah, I'm going to guess for you. Today. I know. I, I don't you know. know. I'm I'm it's the first thing that comes to my, mind. My, my, my so my let's say that their average 16-inch pie is being sold for $14. I, I don't know if that's the price, but... <laughs> Go Based on the math. We'll start at 20 That's a slice? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. What is it now? $24? <laughs> yeah. Okay, $24. Using what we just described, per pie, $24, 10%, yields that rest that operator $2.40 profit. What would one of these providers charge for that same $24 pie that's being sold they're paying 10 to 30% based on the gross sale. Let's use the, the bottom, 10%. But that would be a break-even at best-case scenario for the same pie being delivered whether you picked it up or delivered it through the app. Which is why there's a new app called Slice that has come in to help those Now you're businesses. really confused. <laughs> I was trying to get to something, but I guess we'll, we'll get to that a little later. I think what I was trying to say is there's a real impact based on those fees that are being charged. Agreed. And many of our restaurant operators may not realize that the fees that are being paid has a real toll on their bottom line. That's true. Agreed. And could determine whether it's net profit or net loss. That's where I was headed. But, Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, did we lose our... Oh. I'm going to give you the floor. Sorry. Nope. No oh, questions. I'm waiting for Grubhub. Oh. <laughs> 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 Thank you. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> no? Always appreciate Can the work of SBS. Councilwoman Rosenthal, do you have any questions for SBS? Thank you. Uh, no. You guys are doing a great job, as always. Uh, Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you very much. Look, I was. I hope that you're going to stick around um, or so on because we have a very important here, and I'm going to. I hope that the stakeholders will help us better understand the relationship, the business model, and how it actually works. So. Uh, we have a better understanding on what, if anything, should be done by us. So yeah, thank, thank you very you. much for, for having me here. And by, I won't give you the same kudos that my generous colleague would give you. We have work to do. Yeah, but I know you feel it in your heart. I know. <laughs> <laughs>
There's a lot of things great, and we should acknowledge that. But there's also a lot of concerns, and we think today is a great opportunity for all of us to come together and talk about these issues and hopefully, as a result of this hearing, get answers. So instead of just telling you what some of those concerns are, which I know there's restaurateurs here that will do that, I'm going to pose a list of questions that I think would be extremely helpful for the council to be able to contemplate in determining how they proceed. So first, do companies use their market share in any way to extract higher fees from restaurants? Uh, are search algorithms ever used to enhance or reduce search placement, in particular when a restaurant hasn't paid a higher fee for such placement? Have sales representatives ever been privy to delivery companies search function and used it to sell higher fee placements? And what I mean by that is, is a restaurant on a platform, do they see a huge jump in sales and then they see a drop in sales and get a call from a representative saying, hey, if you increase you know, your fees, the percentage you pay, we will bump up your uh, presence and placement in the uh, search function. Uh, that is something that should definitely be looked into. Uh, when it comes to restaurant websites, are any companies purchasing URLs similar to the name of a restaurant and making it show higher in the result and then trafficking that business uh, through that website to ensure the delivery company gets the fee versus if a customer just went to the actual restaurant's website and placed an order and paid no fee or a lower fee. Um, why can delivery platforms take a percentage of a liquor license establishment revenue without being on a liquor license, like every other person or entity should? Um, are there any exclusive contracts that you will, can only be on one delivery platform and not be on others? Or I say, and or are there provisions that would prohibit a restaurant from selecting which platform they want to be on from one company? For example, if a delivery platform has a catering platform as well as an individual order platform, are they required to be on both? Because, as we've heard before, and I'm sure we'll hear later, Often restaurants may lose money on the individual orders, but they may make more money on catering orders. So they may only want to be on the catering platform. Can they choose to be on both or just one? A big one that's talked about these days with all technology companies is who owns the customer data? If I've been on a restaurant platform for several years and I've transacted, I don't know, 20,000 different orders, and I say I want to leave this platform, do I own that customer data? Is that my data? I'm delivering to them. They're my customer. Or am I in a position where if I get off the platform, I've effectively lost all of those customers, which clearly could be devastating to small businesses. Um, when it comes to some of the bogus or fees that should not have been charged to restaurants, whether it's through phone calls or otherwise, um, Restaurants are spending an extremely long time trying to go back into their records to determine whether or not all of the fees that are being charged to them are legitimate or not. Is there anything that the delivery companies can do to provide all of that information? It shouldn't be the responsibility of the restaurant to go back and look at their files for years uh, to determine which fees may or may not be legitimate. And if there were illegitimate fees, there should be no 30 or 60 day um, uh, time frame in which they will pay them back. If there are illegitimate fees being uh, charged for three year period, well, they should all be given back and it should not be the responsibility of the restaurateur to go back in all their records and try to figure out which ones are or are not uh, legitimate. Um, and in addition to the fees uh, that we've heard that may not be legitimate, are there other types of fees that may be fake, not 
being, you know, not not legitimate for other types of orders. You know, we know that there's people that have had issues with the phone call fees. Are there any other types of fees that shouldn't have been assessed in the first place? Um, we should get down to that. And I think, again, I don't know all the answers to these questions. One of the questions or the many questions that we have is that many people don't know. And as was discussed on the earlier panel, um, these contracts can be very confusing, especially if you are a small business owner. And are there companies that have such a large part of market share where businesses feel that they cannot not be on a platform, but feel like they really can't afford being on that platform either. Because what happens is restaurants do generate a lot of business through these delivery platforms, and that's why it's a great thing. However, if they're in a scenario where they're relying on those that income to just offset their operating costs, labor, food costs, rent, they may not necessarily be making money off of that revenue, but they can't just drop the delivery because they're required to bring in that revenue to cover other operating expenses. So I'll leave it at that, but all of these questions would be extremely helpful from all the delivery platforms, not just the ones that are uh, here today. And I thank you for uh, your consideration. Thank you, uh, Andrew. But I just because you asked the question that struck me as odd, we've heard of the alleged phone charge but you're indicating there's other charges out there that there's illegal charges. I do not know, but if there is one, you call it a legal charge, or if there's one charge that shouldn't have been charged, I would think a smart business owner would begin to look at all the other charges to ensure that there are no additional bogus charges. So I don't know, but I definitely think it's something that should be discussed because, again, as you know, restaurateurs are extremely busy and trying to go through all the different fees on one of the million different statements that they receive. Just you're not aware of anything. That's something I am not. You're, you're just asking. I, I am potential asking potential and hopefully we'll have a better understanding Correct. of the fee structure. Yes, and perhaps there have been in the past and they've self-corrected, um, but I think that that would be helpful. And correct, yes. And if they went on the record and said that they weren't, that would also be helpful and give us comfort. Elaborate on customer data. What do you mean exactly? So as a restaurant, um, I am generating orders through one of the many different platforms. That information is usually the customer's name, address, and their order history. Um, this email address um, and other types of uh, information that they may collect. Um, how, do I own that information? So if I was to leave one of these delivery platforms and said, there's been 20,000 people that have ordered through your platform to my restaurant. I want all the names. I want all of the emails. I want all of their order history. Is that information provided to me? One. And two, is that information then being used, the customer information being used by the delivery company to promote other restaurants? Is it my data? Do I own those customers? Um, and that's a big question because, again, if I'm going to lose all of the people who have ordered from me over the years, well, I may not be able to leave that platform. But based on the information that you receive from your restaurant mm -hmm. owners, the group, what have they said when it comes to that data? What is their experience? Have they been able to request it? Were they provided that information? Was it not yeah. readily available? What I have been told is that no, they do not own that customer information. They being the, the, they they the restaurants. restaurants. Do not own that customer data. So the email addresses, uh, the names, the phone numbers. I, um, Correct. And now I can't specify exactly which delivery platforms that they are, but as a general response from restaurateurs when I ask, do you own the customer data or does the delivery platform own the customer data? I have been told that the delivery company owns the customer data. And what was that about websites? Yes. in the actual mm. name. Why, I, I want a little clarity on that. So if I own andrewsbarandgrill.com, I may not also own andrewsbarandgrill.net or .org or .nyc. Um, are delivery companies purchasing similar domains, setting up websites, 
similar to Andrew's Bar and Grill. So, when, and with their sophistication, being able to make andrewsbarandgrill.net appear higher than the real Andrew Ridgey Bar and Grill Dot com. So when they go and you do a search function, is Andrew Ridgey Bar and Grill dot net coming up first? And if that is true, you know, is it directing it through to a de- delivery platform where I'm paying a higher fee? And I bring that up because my understanding with certain platforms is that if a customer goes directly to the delivery platform website, they will pay a higher fee. If they go directly to the restaurant website, they'll have sometimes a widget for the delivery platform uh, on their website. In that case, they may pay a slightly lower fee. However, if there's these shell websites being set up on behalf of restaurants, one, they're setting up websites for restaurants without their permission, which is of concern. But two, I would imagine and again, again, these are questions. I would imagine that they, if deliveries were driven through that .net, they would be paying the, the restaurant would be paying the higher fee, not the lower fee than if they ordered directly through the actual restaurant site. I, I want to be specific. I'm told there's a term for this it's uh, called cyber squatting. When you, when you hijack when you hijack someone's uh, website and you basically use it for your own purposes. But I'm, I don't know, maybe the terms and conditions uh, waive that. I, I, I so my question is direct. Mm-hmm. Is this happening to andrewsbar.com where they're now a phantom cyber squatting yes. andrewsbar.net is being promoted through a provider? Yes, I have been told by several people that that is correct. Is and it, I would so I, I would just Mr. Chairman, I don't think we were sworn in. N- well, you don't get sworn okay, in. Okay, good. Because he's telling the truth. I, was, <laughs> I want to be clear. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's Scout's honor, right? You I got, got it. it. I got it. <laughs> yeah, we're here. Listen, we hear, as you know, we hear a lot from restaurant tours about this and many, many issues and trying to juggle all of them. People just don't always have all of the information. Again, it goes back to why we thank you for having an oversight hearing because there may be issues at play and there may not be, but this is the way that you can investigate and figure out what's true, what's not true, and what's the best way to move forward. Please explain um, placement, search placement, as you understand it. Sure. So when you sign up on a delivery platform, your restaurant needs to be listed along with all the other restaurants on the platform. Now, I think we can understand, and while people may not like the fees, that if a restaurant is willing to pay more, perhaps they will be listed higher in the search function. However, if you are a restaurant and you are just using the you know basic plan, uh, how does the algorithm, and I go, we're using Italian restaurants, and I put in Italian restaurants in my neighborhood, the Upper West Side where I live. How does the algorithm determine which Italian restaurants on the Upper West Side come up first? If they are not paying more. If they're paying more, that's something else. But orga- in an organic search, how do they come up? Well, what is your understanding of that? I don't know. And, that, and that's my question is something that would be interesting because if that could certainly be adjusted, again, claims that people are listed uh, higher or lower based on the amount of delivery traffic they generate, uh, the amount of fees they pay. You know, there can be multiple factors. And again, if are they using, paying, you know, are they using other companies, you know, as well? It, it, it's a it's a major fear, Mr. Chairman. So it, it would be good to get an answer on the record on that. And you have no understanding how the algorithms currently work for those that are not participating in additional fee service. It's not alphabetical. It's not in distance from where Uh, your device is or anything of that. It's just arbitrary. I I don't believe it's published. And I think this is part of the much larger conversation we're having about tech in general, Um, you know, ownership of information, um, how you see things in your feed, when you see them, why you see them. So I don't know if it's available, or perhaps it is, but maybe it's not. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm Rob Bookman. I'm uh, the counsel to the 
uh, organization that uh, Andrew is executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. We represent approximately 2,000 uh, establishments in the city of New York, from small mom and pops to hotels and uh, bars and nightclubs and everything in between. Uh, I want to thank you very much, you know, for doing this hearing. You are um, a true friend and advocate of the small business community and your chairmanship of this committee and i've been involved in the council on and off for 30 some odd years now i've never seen anything as you know, like it so we really want to thank you um and i want to also thank the new york post if they're here for doing the stories that they did on this is this issue um, I feel a little bit like for those who have ever attended a Jewish Passover Seder, where you start off with what they call the four questions, and then it goes, okay, now let's do the answers. So Andrew started with the, with the questions, and now let's get into some answers, um, which you will start hearing with from some restaurateurs. Uh, as you said, it's not the 1950s anymore. You know, it's not Ozzy and Harriet, where mom is at home making a delicious, you know, home-cooked meal, you know, dinner seven nights a week. That's not where we are as a society. Takeout has become the norm, especially in large cities like New York, where people are working harder and longer hours and multiple jobs and single parents. And delivery has become an increasing part of that takeout culture. Uh, so, you know, these, these companies are not our enemies. You know, no, no question way, Robert, about it. You left out that very important fact that the between making at home and ordering out, uh, I just cleaned out my kitchen drawer where I used to keep all the menus oh, exactly. so I would remember how to get in touch with the restaurant. But go ahead. And my three children in their 20s still laugh at me when I pull out a menu because they say, you know, why? We could just seamless tonight, you know. Um, and that's the reality that we face. Uh, increasingly, uh, people don't want to even have a, a call with, you know, with directly with, with a person. They want to use an app. They want to uh, not interact with people. They want to do it online, you know, on their phone. And so it is not an option for the thousands of restaurants in New York City to say either no thanks to delivery or if you deliver, increasingly, it's not an option to say no to the Grubhubs and Seamlesses of the world. It's something that you can't live with them, and, and increasingly, you can't, you can't live without them, and increasingly, you can't live with them. And that's, I think, why we're having this hearing. So there are three points, large points, I want to address. One is, has Seamless Grubhub become a monopoly you know, in New York City? You know, now, I'm not an antitrust expert, and I uh, haven't taken an antitrust law, you know, course since law school, which was many decades ago. But it seems to me that it's starting to look like one and act like one. Um, as is common in the tech world, when there, are, when there is competition, they don't compete, they buy them out. I don't blame them, but that's the way the tech world works. So anytime a good company develops, they get bought out. Um, they are secretive with their information and their algorithms. The reason why we're raising those questions is because we don't know the answers. That's typical of monopol monopoly. Uh, they raise their prices because they can, because you, need, you can't live without them, and so you have to live with them, and they keep raising their prices, which they've done over the years, uh, to the point where now, as you point out, and it's not difficult math, you're losing money on your delivery orders. And so to go back to my prior point, then why do it is because you have no choice today. You can't say no to delivery. You can't say no to the behemoth platforms. Um, it's churning work. It's keeping your employees busy. You're afraid that customers won't ever come in to dine in the restaurant if they don't have the option for the delivery, but you're losing money on every delivery. Can you give me a rough estimate on industry standards based on profitability of products? We, they, they were right before. 10% net profit used to be the gold standard for in, in in dining, you know, you know, restaurants, white table cloth restaurants, we used to call it, you know, fine dining, even casual dining, 10% uh, net profit. Um, that's considered very successful in today's day and age for all the reasons that you know and that we've testified at other hearings, uh, labor, everything else. 8%, uh, 7% people will be happy to make today. So, yes, if you are on that $20 order, paying 15%, 18% to a delivery platform, you're losing money on that order. The math is not difficult. You, you, know, you, you are losing money that's on that order. That's fine dining. What about the other types of... Uh... Casual dining, uh, you know, uh, where, you know, the, um, 
the uh, Chipotle type of you know, situations where uh, you you know you you walk up to a counter to get the food and you sit down by their cells has a has a higher profit margin because they have a lot less labor and a lot less labor costs. Um, Industry standards. Fifteen percent. Yeah, I think they're running around fifteen percent. And you know, of course, you know, we, we love we love all of our options, but you know. Fine dining is the one that provides the most amount of good-paying jobs, you know, both in the front of the house and the back of the house. Well, we love them all in New York. Um, so it's, you know, it seems to me, and by the way, as you well know, there are restaurant owners who have come to you privately to discuss this who have expressed out, out fear to come to here today publicly to testify. Now, I'm not saying their fear is justified. I have no idea. But the, what, it, what is a fact is they're fearful. They're fearful that their placements might be lowered, not tomorrow, but two months from now. Uh, and that's typical reaction when you're dealing with a monopoly. So I don't know if they're a monopoly. I don't know what their market share is. Probably only they do. But it seems to me, and we're calling today for both the federal government and the attorney general's office of the state of New York to look into this issue. And I know the AG's office once did, you know, with Seamless once upon a time. They did have a consent agreement or a stipulation with them where they agreed for a certain amount of time not to buy out anybody. And as soon as that expired, you know, they started to buy out you know, other entities. So that's number one. Number two, there's a need for more transparency. As Andrew has raised many, many questions, much of that goes to the issue of transparency, both for the small businesses and for consumers in the city of New York. And that is a New York City role, pure and simple. Right. I'm, just, an, I'm, I just, I'm an old Department of Consumer Affairs attorney, you know, from New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. I was counsel there. And consumer protection, disclosures, so everybody in the marketplace knows what's going on. That's the wheelhouse of, of, of New York City government and local government, and, and we need to address a lot of these transparency issues. just want to be clear on transparency. I don't expect uh, Italy Pizza to tell me their secret sauce and their ingredients. I don't think we're going to expect any online provider or industry out there to tell us their industry secrets. We want to be mindful of these things. We want to be transparent as much as possible, but certainly not infringe upon anyone's business model and undermine how they make their sauce to how algorithms actually work in the sense of if there is a model there that works, that, and apparently it does, uh, we want to be mindful of what we're entitled to and what we're not entitled to. I think you understand the gist. Clearly do, and this is a national conversation going on now in Congress and elsewhere with a new industry that is now a significant industry, the entire tech industry, you know, Amazon, you know, the platforms, and government is catching up, you know, and there, and it is a, that there has to be no regulation is not the answer. Overregulation is never an answer either. Um, there has to be a balance between what's your secret sauce and what everybody else has the right to know. Right. You know for example, I, would, I think it's, it, it, it is a positive issue of transparency if customers knew what percentage the restaurants are being forced to pay for each order. That, that's no secret sauce. Uh, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, I would want to call the restaurant more directly if I knew that uh, 15 percent, 18 percent, 20 percent, you know, of, of the order wa was going to a website that does not deliver the food. It does nothing more than transmit an order. You know, something to me sounds like, you know, a buck sounds like about the right price for that. Um, the data that we discussed who owns this data, you know, that's a transparency issue. I would have no problem, and it would be a great idea if Corp Council, with their 800 lawyers, reviewed these contracts for these types of issues and raised it up. Last, and to wrap up, uh, state liquor law. It's, I'm a liquor attorney expert. That's what I do for the most part for a living. Um, you cannot ha have a 1% owner owner. Of a, of a business that has a liquor license without being on the, on the liquor license. Uh, 
we're not allowed to pay our vendors percentages of revenues. We have to pay them flat rates because the liquor law says if you pay percentage, you're a partner, and a partner must be on the liquor license. These delivery platforms are not on liquor licenses. I imagine they are not interested in being on 12,000 liquor licenses in the city of New York and having those issues and liabilities. Um, this is an issue for the State Liquor Authority, who, who has provided confusing guidance to the industry on this issue, and we, we are calling on the State Liquor Authority to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Andres Kutsadakis here from Tribeca's Kitchen. Uh, dear members of the Committee on Small Business, thank you for, for having this today, for actually taking the time to listen to small business owners and the issues and explore possible solutions. Um, I'm here today on behalf of Tribeca's Kitchen, a local diner where you'll find my father six to seven days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day. Uh, I can't tell you how many emails, calls, and in-store visits we get from tech companies offering some new app or product that is positioned as a no monthly fee service. Uh, in reality, I wish it was a monthly fee because 10 to 20, 20 to 30 percent commission models just don't work in a positive way for my business or for any of the other of these small businesses anymore. These are marketing machines that we're talking about here that are backed by resources that no small business can ever obtain. And thus, our, co our customers are forever hijacked with no end in sight in terms of what they can do to change our entire local restaurant industry. The more they grow, the more market share they gain, and the more power these third-party companies will continue to have to unilaterally dictate what the terms of our relationship with them will be, whether we like it or not. It's already at a destructive level, but you, our, elective, our elected city council members and this mayor, have an opportunity to think about the forgotten little guys, the small business owner who lives or dies with their business. That's all they have. If they lose, so do the other little guys. They're employees. So does our city, and so does our character as a unique and creative bustling city. If you remove all of the one-off small business restaurants from our great city, will New York City be the New York City people expect and know it to be? That's an absolute no. Think long and hard about what you can do to help our local businesses. They need a strong backing, strong enough to have a level playing field with these behemoth venture capital backed marketing machines that are taking over our restaurants and drastically changing our entire restaurant industry. Our city council must be our backing. Right now, backing and support of small businesses by our city council is non-existent, and that's not okay. In closing, I ask that all our city council members and Mayor de Blasio start thinking about short-term and long-term impact policies and ways to support our communities and the small businesses in them. They may not be huge political wins overnight, and they may never even be realized during your term. That doesn't mean they are not crucial to our city's successful future. You may not be able to solve a problem head on, but maybe you can help in other ways. Get creative, figure it out. Or maybe we figure it out. Imagine what would happen if every small business restaurant owner in the city shut down for a day at the same time. How much revenue would be lost? How much tax revenue would be lost? How much salaries would be lost? What would happen? Maybe that would be catch the city council's attention. Thank you for your time, and I really hope my testimony was helpful to your understanding of what is happening right now. Thank you. I want to thank you, Andreas, uh, first of all, for investing in this great city um, through sweat equity. Uh, I understand what you go through day in and day out, and I'm a strong advocate for small business. I know you are. Thank you. I want to make sure that you are in an environment where you can continue to thrive and flourish um, and that you stay in business. I value what you bring to this city. I value the, um, the number of people you employ and the tax base that you are and the service that you offer to not only New Yorkers, but to tourists that come from all over the world. So yep. thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, we'll go to the next panel. Thank you. Our next panel uh, will be No from Uber Eats, Sammy from Grubhub, and Kevin from Grubhub. I 
And I just want to thank you all for uh, your patience. Um, and I hope you got something out of allowing that panel to go first so we have a better understanding of what the issues are that they bring to our attention. So thank you. And in no particular order, I'll start with any of you. My name is Noelle from Uber Eats. Uber Eats welcomes a conversation with the city, New York City Council on the topic of food delivery services. Over the past several years, the process of food delivery has evolved significantly. What used to be a simple relationship among a consumer, food establishment, and a delivery person now also includes app-based technology and major national corporations. Because of the growing complexity of the food delivery business, we appreciate this opportunity to explain the brief history of Uber Eats and how our business currently operates in New York. Uber Eats began operating in April 2015 as a small operation that quickly delivered meals in Midtown Manhattan. By April the following year, the business had grown to partner with more than 100 businesses and was operating from early in the morning through late at night. Currently, Uber Eats serves customers in all five boroughs with delivery options from thousands of restaurants, eateries, delis, and other food establishments across the city. One of the reasons we have been able to grow our business successfully in New York is because we value our restaurant partners and we demonstrate that through a quick and transparent onboarding process. When a restaurant or other food establishment is interested in partnering with Uber Eats, a member of our team will walk the restaurant contact through the basic options included in our partnership using their own delivery workers, using Uber Eats delivery partners, or a combination of both, and explain to them the difference between each option. Once the restaurant partner has determined which delivery method they prefer, we share them on a brief, plain language contract which outlines the costs, and upon agreement, get them up and running on our app quickly. We are committed to no hidden fees to restaurants. We don't charge for credit card processing, and we don't charge higher rates for lead generation. Our model is straightforward and transparent from the beginning. Restaurants can choose to pay a 15% fee and use their own delivery workers, or pay a 30% fee to use Uber Eats delivery partners. We provide our restaurant partners with the necessary hardware and software to manage their operations through data and have Eats experts on hand to troubleshoot any issues the partner experiences in real time. We understand that restaurants small and large are adapting to the changing landscape of food delivery across the city. And our goal at Uber Eats is to make that process as transparent and fair as possible so they can continue to grow their customer base and prosper. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Um, just explain a little bit about the business model. So you're not providing new customers, you're just providing a service. Is that what you're saying? We are a technology company that offers uh, an opportunity for restaurants to be shown to eaters who use our app. So your ad placement, is that the same? Um, I think by ad placement, um, do you mean on the web or? Right, I search Reggie's Pizza. Yes. At that point, there is a, li a slew of uh, pop-ups that come up. Yes. One of them would be Uber Eats. Yes. And based on the click, determines whether or not you get the sales transaction for that? So to clarify, um, when you search for Reggie's Pizza on, uh, let's say, Google, um, the first hit may be a Google ad for Reggie's Pizza. Um, who knows if they paid for that ad. Uh, then the second hit may be a link to either an Uber Eats website or, for example, Grubhub's website or any of the other competitors out there, um, where if you click Uber Eats, you will then see uh, Reggie's Pizza's Uber Eats page. It is very clearly marked that it would be Uber Eats. And that's where, depending on the option, 15% yes. your own driver or 30% yes. all-inclusive, a combination which includes credit cards and so on and so forth. Yes. How do you determine, oh, well, actually, so if I searched Italian, and the list that showed up, the names of yes. the various eateries. How is that determined? Are you charging for a lead placement? No, so we offer a flat fee to restaurants, the 30% or the 15, um, and there is no sort of increase or decrease in fee to do app placement, uh, so how that restaurant appears in our app. So let me understand. Where would Reggie's Pizza 
be listed on their search for pizza on their Uber Eats? Great question. We actually get that question a lot. So if I am a the number one Reggie's Pizza customer, and I always use Uber Eats to order Reggie's Pizza, I guarantee when I open the app, if I'm within the Reggie Pizza area, Reggie's Pizza will be number one. But on the converse, if I only eat Hawaiian food, then only Hawaiian restaurants would be surfaced at the top. So our algorithm, part of it uses the individual customer's preferences to help uh, sort which restaurants will appear first. So if I've never ordered online before, and as God is my witness, I haven't. Uh, my boys tease me about that often. Uh, so you have no history on me. If I search pizza and using, and I just happen to come across Uber, where will I find Reggie's Pizza? It will vary based on a number of factors that our data science team uses, but we do not charge restaurants for different placement levels within our app. So how, is it alphabetical? Is it no. geographic? Is it? It's a data science model, and I think to the point that you alluded earlier, I, I don't have that information, and, and I think as part of our trade secrets per se, we, we wouldn't share that explicitly out, the exact algorithm. You understand the concerns? Yes. Of many of these restaurants? Yes. And you heard what those restaurants? Yes. I think for us, we are very proud that we do not currently charge restaurants for different placement uh, options or sort algorithm placement within our app. It is what, a fair playing field for all restaurants. What about the data? I ju it was just brought up that the data doesn't belong or may not belong to the actual restaurant. So name, phone number, email address, all of that information. Is that the case with Uber Eats? So at Uber and at Uber Eats, we have a strict uh, confidential confidentiality and commitment to protecting our customers' um, private information. So we do not share details of the customers, including their email address or their phone numbers with our restaurant partners. What do you do with that data? Do you package it and resell it to anyone else? Do you provide it to a database of email addresses? Does uh, anyone out there in the universe get that information from you, can purchase that information from you, or is entitled to that information from you? No, so Uber Eats protects our, our customer data, um, and that is a uh, very, very high priority for us. So no one ever sees that information. That is just on the lock and key. Yes, that is one of Uber's number one core principles is that we protect our customer data. Okay. Um, what about the commissions? You, is there any surcharges in addition to the two options that you mentioned, 15 percent, 30 percent, and that inclu that's inclusive of credit card fees? Is there any other charges or surcharges? Uh, any other fees on orders? No, there are no other fees. No charges, no fees. This is a take. You have, uh, so when you sign the contract, there are two fees. There is a marketplace fee, which is the 15 and the 30 percent that I had referenced, um, and we also charge an activation fee. So in, in other words, similar to a gym membership join fee, um, when restaurants first join the platform, and that is clearly articulated in the contract that we walk our restaurants through when they join Uber Eats. No more fees. Anyway. No more. No fees. hidden. Nothing. No hidden fees. Only the 15 and the 30. Okay. Do you charge your commission based on the gross sale, which includes sales tax, or exclusive of sales tax? Exclusive of sales tax. They, anyone can at any time cancel a contract with you. At they, any time. And they can have more than one provider in conjunction with Uber Eats. Yes. You're not exclusive. You're not exclusive. And what would it, uh, I think that's it. Great. Thank you. But you may want to stay up there because we may have a question for you across the board. <laughs> Thank you. Great. All right. Good afternoon, Chair Joe and I. Uh, and members of the Small Business Committee, uh, wherever they may be. Uh, We're all watching. <laughs> uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today uh, to talk about how Seamless, uh, or as you may know, uh, Grubhub or Seamless, uh, helps restaurants grow. Uh, my name is Sammy Naeem. I'm Director of Public Policy for Grubhub. With me today is Kevin Kern, Senior Vice President of our Restaurant Network. 
Uh, as you may know, we've been operating in New York since 1999. We employ nearly 400 people on three floors across the street from Bryant Park. Our employees literally live, work, breathe, and eat New York. They also have helped drive billions of dollars of revenue to restaurants and $1 billion in tips to delivery workers. I just would just like to provide a few uh, specifics about our business model before answering your questions. One, our marketing platform levels the playing field for independent restaurants. Here in New York, about 90% of the restaurants on our platform are small businesses, which don't necessarily have the financial resources expertise or scale to advertise and compete with larger chains. That's where we come in. We help drive more orders to these restaurants than they could attract on their own by providing them access to our 20 million diners. We also have a multilingual restaurant success team that works with restaurant owners to ensure they get the most out of Grubhub. From designing a restaurant's menu to sending photographers out to take pictures of the food to collaborating on promotions, we work with restaurants to craft strategies to help them attract new customers, generate additional orders, and earn more revenue. Two, restaurants are getting more orders through our platform. Restaurants who contract with us see a 20% increase in takeout orders and a 30% increase in takeout revenue. The impact is even greater for smaller restaurants, which see a 50% increase in takeout revenue. In fact, restaurants that use our platform make six times more monthly revenue than restaurants not on the platform. Three, restaurants are making more money year over year using our platform. Since 2014, restaurants are getting more orders with larger overall ticket prices through our platform on a year over year basis. In other words, not only are restaurants getting more orders, but each order is getting bigger as well. This translates into increased incremental revenue that more than offsets any negotiated commission. Four, restaurants attract new customers using our platform. I'm sure you've seen our seamless How New York Eat ads on subways and taxis or our grub up TV spots. That's not by accident. In the past three years alone, we've spent more than $150 million aimed at attracting more diners onto our platform including coupons, discounts, and promotional codes that ultimately mean more customers for restaurants. As one restaurant owner in the Upper East Side recently shared with us, quote, I consider the fees that Grubhub charges for their service as my marketing budget without having to outlay funds that I do not have in order to be able to compete. Five, there is no cost for restaurants to join our platform. There are no startup fees, subscription fees, equipment fees, long-term commitments, or cancellation fees. For rest on our platform, restaurants can decide whether they want to use our delivery service, handle delivery on their own, or don't do delivery at all and simply use us for pickup. And ultimately, we only make money when a restaurant makes money. Six, and I'll end with this, we are an active part of the New York community and we give back. Our platform and diners have helped enable the donation of $9 million since September of last year. These donations have gone to charitable organizations benefiting the communities we serve. Charitable organizations such as NYC Kids Rise, which sets up college savings account for children, No Kid Hungry, which attacks childhood hunger and poverty, and the James Beard Foundation's Women Leadership Program to combat gender inequity in the restaurant industry. On that point, additionally, we have championed the cause of increasing the number of women-led restaurants through our Restaurant Her initiative. Underlying all of this is our company mission, to be a true partner for restaurants. We provide them with the tools to attract, retain, and maintain loyal, profitable customers. We are the marketing, technology, and in some cases, the logistical partners that allow restaurants to focus on what they do best, making great food. We have been in business 20 years and worked with tens of thousands of restaurants during that time. We feel that the restaurants cited in recent news reports may represent a minority. That's, in fact, many restaurants that had a different story wanted to be here today, but for reasons the Small Business Committee can surely understand, it's the middle of the lunch rush. That being said, I would love to have set up time for you to hear from the restaurants directly on their positive experience with Seamless and Grubhub. Thank you for allowing me to testify today, and be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Sammy.
before we continue with you, because I just want to make sure that I understand that Uber Eats wanted to make an amendment to what they just went on a record with. Is that correct? No? About the fees? No. Okay. We're going to swing back to you because this is a much, much more complicated question, and I want to stay focused on the testimony that we just heard. Earlier we heard there's an industry standard for profitability on food service. And we've heard somewhere around 10% people would be, or those operators would be extremely happy. Is that your understanding as well? Hi, I'm Kevin Kearns. Um, by the way, thank you for having us. I appreciate the opportunity to talk directly to some of our clients today. Um, I do run a restaurant network. So the, uh, I'd like to answer that question um, specifically in terms of the profitability. I don't have the industry data there. Um, it, sounds, it sounds approximately right, but I want to make sure that we address the item of um, how restaurants, if they're, if they're helped, uh, by using a service like ours. So if you don't mind, I'd like just to talk through a little bit of the pricing model and how we help restaurants with that, if that's okay. All right, thank you. So first of all, our, our pricing model has three components. There's a marketing fee, which gets you access to our more than $20 million, our 20 million diners um, that are on the platform. So that marketing fee um, ranges up to 20%, depending on the number of um, promotions that a restaurant wants. That is freely negotiated by the restaurant, um, and oftentimes we will get restaurants asking um, to have more promotions, and, and certainly that, that costs more money. The second fee that is optional is a delivery fee. So we charge generally around 10%. We do charge 10% on a delivery fee. So for example, a $10 order, we would charge $1 to do that, do that delivery. Um, the th important part I want to make about that is that over half of the restaurants do their own delivery. So they're not, they don't, they're not dependent on us to do the delivery. Um, they can certainly choose to do that themselves. So over half of our clients actually choose to do self-delivery, just, just so you know that. The third component of our costs is order processing fees. So we do, we do charge an order processing fee, and that covers the credit card fees, um, undeliverable orders, fraudulent orders, things like that. Um, and, and that is something that restaurants have the, uh, they would pay anyway uh, if they were using a credit card in the, in the um, restaurant. But there's a couple things I want to share about the profitability that I think is really important. Number one is that there are multiple studies in the industry that show that online orders are at least 20% or more higher than in a restaurant. So for example, if you're ordering a um, cheeseburger in a restaurant, um, the server isn't always exactly saying, do you want bacon on that? Do you want avocados on that? Whereas an app will automatically you know, offer um, different items that are generally a very high gross margin for a restaurant. So there are many um, statistics that show, I was just reading one the other day that says the average ticket is more than 23% higher when ordered online. The other key point I wanna make is that diners that order online are highly likely to come into the restaurant over time. So while you pay for the service of using Grubhub Seamless or, or anyone in the industry, the, the, if you have a great experience at that restaurant, you're highly likely to come into that restaurant, right? So we enable restaurants to get um, new diners um, at a very high rate. So that is a really important point that we want to make. The other on the, the sense of profitability is that, or the, the how we affect profitability, the because we have more than 20 million diners on our app, we get um, generally a restaurant when they sign up with us, get incremental diners. So there's no fixed fees to cover, right? They're already paying their rent, they're already paying for the tables, they're already paying their utilities. So these are just incremental um, orders and diners that are coming in. So um, the, generally that, that is a much higher, um, less burden on the restaurant. We also bring orders in at off times a day when they have staff that is idle. So that's another, another plus for them. So, so these are some ways that, that can easily offset the fees that we charge for a restaurant. We wanna make sure that's important. A couple other key points, we only pay for orders that are delivered, right? So there's, as Sammy mentioned, there's no upfront um, fees. And it really levels the playing field for small businesses 
businesses to keep, compete against larger regional and um, national, national chains. Um, the other thing that we provide is world-class customer service. So I run our network and we've tripled the size of our restaurant success team. And we work every day with restaurants, helping them optimize their listing, like have better photos, look at the um, delivery boundaries, uh, look at all sorts of different things. There's a, there's a couple of quick examples I'd like to give. Um, one is that there is a restaurant on the Upper East Side that serves sushi. And they, we worked with them and they said, we said that there's a trend for poke bowls, right? That's a, a very, what? poke bowls? They're a, <laughs> they're a very common, they, they use fish. And, and anyway, we suggested that they start adding some of these items to their menu. Um, they did this and within one month, they doubled their orders. Um, and within three months, they 7X their orders to 1,600 orders a month. This is a small business that went all the way up to 1,600 orders a month. Um, and they actually changed the name of their restaurant to put, put that name at Pokey in their restaurant because it's worked so well. So these are, these are um, another example, one other quick example I would like to give, and that is, um, this is on the record for testimony, but Robert Eby of EJ's Luncheonette on the Upper East Side, and I quote, uh, Grubhub has enabled me to grow my business in the past 10 years in great proportion. Prior to the advent of Grubhub, my only options to reach new customers was through direct mailings and standing on street corners handing out takeout menus. Grubhub's model has enabled me to reach many customers in my delivery area that I otherwise would have been unable to reach. So in general, I want to make sure that, that we all understood kind of the model that we bring to the table. Thank you, uh, Kevin, for that explanation. I ask questions that you may have answers to. If you're not sure, please don't answer. But I believe you know where I'm headed on the industry profits on the sales of their products. There's an industry standard out there. And for the record, I worked in a pizzeria from fifth grade through college. Uh, so the markups obviously changed over the years and fluctuated. But there was a industry standard. And there was an, an expectation that at the end of the day, if you did X in sales, it yielded Y in profit. And that included labor, ingredients, overhead, fixed costs, rent, utilities, and so on and so forth. There is a specific dollar amount that, or percentage point that's always attributed to industries. And if we're going to answer the question is 10% the fee, the profit on gross sales, exclusive of taxes, sales I, tax in particular. I can't give you that specific number. What would you, as you know it, arrange? Uh, it, the range you put out sounds appropriate, but again, I do not have specific knowledge. Mm -hmm. I do know that um, there have been industry analysts that look at this exact question. Do the economics work uh, for restaurants and delivery? And I think we've submitted those into the record. And the answer is yes, they do work. Uh, and that the orders, as Kevin mentioned, uh, are not only incremental in that they're additional orders, they're bigger orders, and the volume of orders are orders they would otherwise not get that leverage their fixed costs. And so there are multiple economists that have worked and looked at this to really put us under the ringer. Are we a good business? Because our business model rests on uh, serving restaurants and making sure that the restaurants are there for us to deliver to and from. And, uh, and we've submitted those to say, yes, the economics actually work. The size, order, and magnitude of the orders coming in make it worthwhile. Okay. Would you be surprised to learn that, or would you be surprised if I told you restaurants don't make more than 10% profit on the sales of their products? Yeah. No, right? No. Okay, I'm not either, because that's probably the norm. <laughs> So the question is, on an order uh, that is placed through or generated through your platform, mm -hmm. the fee that is charged by percentage is up to 30%, correct? 20% correct. plus the yeah, delivery, delivery fee option, correct? Correct. Is there any fee higher than that that would be... There may be there may be a few examples of that. I don't have any of the data with me, but um, we'll go back to that. Yeah. Yep. 
So why would we go back to Reggie's Pizza, because he makes some great pizza, um, if he's making 10% on his $24 pie, yields him $2.40 in profit. If the same pie is sold through your app, 30% of that is uh, that 240 times three, he would, need, he would yield a net loss on that transaction. I would go back to a couple of points we made earlier. Mm. Um, first of all, this is an, these are incremental orders that we're bringing restaurants, right? So they are, they are not, um, they still have to pay their rent. So when we bring extra diners in, that they are, are basically incremental orders to the restaurant. So there's no fixed fees that they have to pay for that, right? They still have to pay their rent. They still have to pay their utilities, right? So when an order comes in, it's, it's absolutely incremental to them. So that, that changes the, the profit economics right there. The other thing I would say, I would go back to the things that we cited. One is that online orders are generally larger than orders in-house. So if you paid $24 for your pizza from, from Reggie, um, you may have added a couple, you might have added wings or you might add something that is suggestively sold in the, in the app and um, the order would be larger and hopefully a higher gross margin product on that or extra toppings and things like that. So that's another point. Kevin, I'm going to go back the other way. All right, Reggie just signed the agreement with you. This is day one yeah. of your platform. Yeah. He's never had an order from your platform before. Right. He knows that 10% of his sales are profit. On the first order, through your, pro through your platform, paying 30% is a net loss. There's no increase. It's one simple order. Your costs have not come down because it's the first order. Would you agree with me, because I'm not a dentist and I don't think I'm pulling teeth, but math is math. Uh -huh. um, on that first order, through your platform, Reggie's Pizza is looking at a net loss. I would say a couple things to that. Remember <laughs> okay. that it's, it's a... It's also marketing. He's getting a new diner, right? So he's getting a diner he's never I'm had. with you. And so he could advertise on a billboard. He could do advertising in a, in a trade. He could, you know, do digital, digital emails, things like that. So that is a marketing fee. Um, certainly, that, that's why we call it the marketing fee, right? So that is, that is one big thing. He's bringing a new, new diner. And when that order is placed, um, hopefully it's larger. But even if it's not that diner is very likely to come into his restaurant if they had a good experience, right? So this, think of this as almost a customer acquisition tool um, and, and a way to market to over 20 million hungry diners that are looking for great restaurants to eat at. I really am not attacking and I'm just trying to get a benefit. And some of these things have simple yes or no questions and the math is the math and one and one has to equal two without a spin. <laughs> Kevin, that first order is yielding him perhaps a new customer. We're not sure. Mm -hmm. was, he could be a repeat customer or someone that's dined at Reggie's before. But that first transaction with no variables of lowering operating costs based on the increase in sales. So instead of buying one case of cheese, he's buying 10 cases of cheese, lowering the price per unit. I got it. But that first order did not make a difference. And that first order is a net loss using what we believe or the industry standards, the norms of 10% profit on the sale of a product? It's not that yeah. difficult to answer. I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm not I, gonna I hold think, you again, to it. Like and we've, uh, we, we've looked into it, economists have looked into it, uh, and they say the economics work. And to your point, the math is the math. And it says maybe on the monthly, weekly, annual basis that it works out to be a, a value add. And so uh, I not, I'm not a mathematician, so I like, and I'm not good at business myself. You know, I'm not a numbers guy. But uh, I do know that I do know what the numbers guys are telling me, and they're saying, and these are analyst reports that we've submitted for the record, that the economics work. I guess I may not like the answer, but I have to accept it. It's your answer. I understand that this is possibly the first type of a hearing of this sort in the country. Are you... Any of you aware that similar hearings have happened anywhere by a government body, whether it be local or state? 
I'm not. Ah, which we, so New York again continues to be a trailblazer, being at the first, uh, and I'm proud to be a, a part of this historic moment. Um, <laughs> why do you charge a percentage fee and not a monthly fee? We charge a percentage fee because we want to make sure that they only pay for restaurants, pay only for orders that they get, so incremental orders. So for example, if we went the other way and we charged a monthly fee and if they weren't getting many orders, um, they probably wouldn't be happy with us either, right? <laughs> it also allows you to make more money based on increase in sale volume, right? It is a partnership. Right. That's, and that's what, that's what right. this is all about. Um, we want to have a better understanding of the partnership and why you do certain things and why it's beneficial. So you, when I, I really hope that you'll be as transparent as possible or your means allow um, in answering these questions. We just want to have an understanding of your partnership with our eateries and why it's so beneficial. You heard lots of questions that come up, and maybe you can answer some of them and help shed light. Um, in particular, the one that really stuck out to me, and this came out afterwards. Is there any repercussions for a restaurant that may be testifying today that will find their placement dropped? Absolutely not. Um, there will be no repercussions of any kind. Um, in any way, shape, or form. So as a matter of fact, I intend on staying to all the hearings and listening to what they have to say, and I will be handing out my business card to restaurants as the head of um, our restaurant network to help them um, through any issues that they may have. So if Reggie's Pizza has been number seven for the last month, three months from now, after Reggie explains what he believes to be broken with the partnership, he's not going to move from number seven to number 77 or 777. I don't control that, and no, that, that will not happen. That will not happen. That will not happen. So will Reggie will happen. consistently stay in and about where he is. And, and just like uh, I do want to make a comment on the, on the house searches work, it's, it's first and foremost focused on the diner preference, right? So if you look at the search algorithm, while I can't go into every piece of our secret sauce, as you called it before, I, I definitely want to try to be as transparent as possible on that. Um, we first and foremost look at factors like when you're doing a search for Reggie's Pizza, the cuisine type you're looking for, the restaurant rating, um, the proximity to where you are, the estimated wait time, um, all those things factor in because again if you open up our app you know and you don't see the restaurants that you want or like or that are that are interesting to you then then that's not going to uh, you know be a good experience for you as the diner and that wouldn't be good for our business right ratings distance um, if someone like myself was never ordered online you wouldn't I'd have no history so what else would determine uh, proximity, estimated delivery time. Um, we also look um, at what the conversion rates are for the restaurants in the area. So popular restaurants in the area, that's a big piece of it. And your commission rate does have one, fa one piece of the factor of the search. So that um, if you are in a restaurant, all things being equal, then the commission rate will be one factor of many that is, that is considered. What is the basic of plans that you offer percentage-wise that no frills? This is a generic. Uh, no frills can be 15%, mm -hmm. um, and that's it. So if Reggie's Pizza, along with Irene's Pizza, both signed up for the no frills generic brand of services that you offer and both yep. paid 15%, um, and they were both located across the street from each other, yep. as pizzerias often are, and we'll even get going better. Um, they use the same alphabet. Is it alphabetical? Their distance. Their same ratings. Typically, pizzerias don't have much of a rating, but some may. What is the term on placement? Who you, goes first? You may you may have chosen to do more promotions, um, so there's sponsored ads and things in our in our app. No, no frills, fifteen percent straight across the board, no added. It it it. I don't have the exact answer to the algorithm, nor can I explain the um, details of how our algorithm works in in extreme detail. But um, 
generally it's it's focused on what you're looking for and looking for pizza <laughs> yes you have no history on me never ordered and, and before you may have chosen to have more promotions and you paid for promotions um some restaurants choose to do coupons on our app as well never used it before they just signed up you did a you had a great sales rep out there working the area you convinced both of them to sign up on june 1st right then then we would look at the conversion rates of the restaurants but if they're both brand new another factor is um the rate at which you're signed up on Rates the same, no frills, no conversions. Yeah, Who determines placement? How is placement determined? I, beyond that, I, I'm sorry, I can't give you a straight answer on that. It's not my area of expertise. Can you help explain? Or Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it was, as Kevin mentioned, it's, uh, there's a lot number of factors based on like how people are searching. If two restaurants are across the street from each other and are exactly the same in almost every respect, and play exactly the same commission, uh, then, you know, first of all, that's a very rare instance. But no, this is New guess, City. Yeah. We've got several yeah. pizzerias located yeah. on the same street. Yeah, yeah, but at the same time. And some time, factors, sometimes. I imagine, I imagine it'd be alphabetical, but I'll check in on it. I would love to know an answer to that. I'm gonna ho yeah. I hope you really get an answer, because sometimes Irene and Reggie were partners, and then <coughs> they break up their partnership, <laughs> and they open up a Across the street from one another, competing for the same customers, and yeah. this is New York, and these yeah, things happen, and I'm sure you've seen that all. So now I'm gonna guess you come back as a salesperson, right? Send out your sales rep and tell Reggie, Reggie, I will help you sell more pizzas, right? And here's how we're gonna do it. I'm gonna, you're gonna pay 30 percent, correct? but I'm gonna bring a photographer in, I'm gonna take you from the no frills to the top of the line, you're gonna get the Rolls Royce of all services that we can afford you and we're gonna generate sales through the roof. Is that how it's done? Yes, we, we regularly consult with the restaurants and we do offer, when you sign up, we, we charge no charge for any kind of photography. We consult with you on how your menu looks online. So we'll look at things like diner appeal, right? So if you've looked at a, if you've looked at a restaurant and you saw that there's not many pictures or the pictures are dark and dim, um, we'll, we'll help you with that. We'll help you with your delivery boundaries. So we had uh, breakfast this morning with one of our restaurant uh, customers and we talked about extending their delivery boundary by a few blocks because we saw that there's a lot of diners available for them and so we'll help them figure that out as well and so those are just a few of the things that we'll do to help them be successful we have in fact we have a restaurant success team that is dedicated to working with our restaurants each and every day we've tripled the size of that team over the last several years and we believe it's very important. Our, our goal is to help restaurants be very successful in the marketplace. And we work to that end every day. So you approached Reggie, convinced him that you're going to make things happen and increase his sales. He's going to pay more and he'll make more. I would imagine that's how it's yes. done. Great. Then you go across the street again to Irene. Say, Irene. I'm gonna offer you what I just offered Reggie. I'm gonna assure you an increase in sales. You're just gonna pay more, and here's what we're gonna do. Photography, menu. Right. How do we know who gets listed at first billing between Reggie and Irene? We'll get to the answer to that. Okay. It, it, is, it, is, it is, as Kevin mentioned though, there's Cuisine type reviews, distance. They signed at the same time. And, and I think I know up. what you're you're yeah. getting at. I just want to be clear: there is no manipulation of the search based on our interactions with Irene or Reggie. And I, I want to be crystal clear on that. It is the factors that Kevin mentioned, and then we have uh, the option of uh, extra promotions on the, with the sponsored tabs. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to getting some, when you said manipulation research, so your, the algorithm does this, there's no one that's going to plug in a formula that yields Reggie a better return than Irene, unless Irene comes back to, what was that program called, and I thought that was fantastic that you give to, 
Um, restaurant Her? Restaurant Her. And then <laughs> as a member of Restaurant Her, will she get an increase in sales? Uh, that Placement. Uh, I shouldn't say sales. Placement. No, that, that's corporate social responsibility action that we have this separate from the business. It's really pairing and doing mentorship programs and things outside. Again, that does not factor into the search. And um, I know it was mentioned earlier that, oh, you know, if, if there's a negative interaction, we'll sink you in the search. That's not true. I want to be very clear on that. The fee that you charge, 30%, is that inclusive of sales tax or exclusive? Either one. Uh, exclusive. And, and I think on the 30%, just also want to be clear, the average commission in New York City is 15 to 20%. Um, it goes up to 30% if you use uh, the delivery service. However, most restaurants in New York do not use our delivery service. They manage delivery on their own. So again, the average in New York is 15 to 20%. What's the highest percentage in New York using with all of the bells and whistles? I don't know what the yeah. absolute highest is. It's probably not much over that range. We have uh, we have uh, 115,000 clients, so the, the it's a big database. In addition, is there any other fees on top of this fee? There are, no, fee. there are no fees on top of this fee. So you were asking before about hidden fees. Mm -hmm. um, Credit card fees are on top, right? Order processing fees. Order, yes. So there is a fee, okay. Well, I, I outline those. I outline the three categories of fees. So there are marketing fees, which are inclusive of online orders and phone orders. What is those fee, what's those fee structures look like? Uh, as we mentioned, 15 to 20%. Now, uh, by using the 30% with delivery service and all, what other fees are there in addition to that? Only the order processing fee. That is it. And what's that range? Strand standard? 3%. That's basically cover the credit card fees, correct? It covers... It covers uh, credit card fees. It covers um, fraudulent orders, undeliverable orders, things like that. What happens on a fraudulent order? What's that? What happens on a fraudulent order? Uh, in order that we, we pay that. The restaurant does not pay that. So if I use my, if I use a credit card that didn't belong to me to order from Irene's Pizza, and that credit card was stolen, Reported stolen yep. thereafter. Who that's picks on it? Us. That's all on you. Yes. The credit card company doesn't pick that up. It's not reversed on the credit card. Uh, if, if there's liability to the for the order through Grubhub, it's Grubhub pays it. I'm not sure what you're asking. Typically, about the, credit the credit cards card. absorb the fraud fees. Not the consumer, which in this case with the customer, right. which would be the restaurant, right? Am I wrong here, folks? Not anything matter with the EMV. Depending on the flow. More complicated. Yeah. Like everything else in my life. Yeah. Not like I used to be. <laughs> Do we have an idea where that comes from? Or? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Do we have an idea where that comes from? I do not. Maybe we get Uber. Do you have an idea with that? What happens with a fraudulent credit card? Unfortunately, I'm not familiar. More questions. So we all have an understanding of the partnership, and that. And mm -hmm. please don't be discouraged. I'm going to come back to you when I look at a couple of things together. Um, the marketing fee structure. Uh, will determine placement as well as uh, other algorithms that you use, correct? The more and yes. the more they buy into and take advantage of the services you offer should yield a greater return. Correct. Whether they make a profit or not is still questionable, but at least they'll pay more and have more leads for business. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, good. What about the data that we just heard about? What happens to the names, the phone numbers, the histories, the email addresses of those that use your platform? So 
we give we provide restaurants with um, all historical transactional data however we don't give them the customer data in detail um, we do not have access to provide that customer or, or authorization to provide that customer um, data to the to the restaurants um, in addition those are you were talking about a restaurant's customers remember those are incremental customers coming from the platform that were were marketed through Grubhub so it's not like we're you know taking their customers or anything that might have been mentioned before that's not the case and that data is it on the lock-in key as Uber Eats um, explained that there's no one that has access to those email addresses you're not packaging them and selling them to a third-party provider there is no history that's given to anyone or names and addresses or anything of that nature that is correct lock and key no one ever sees it can't get out of your safe correct thank you <clears throat> on the And you share that no from that information with no one at all. That is correct. Okay. It was earlier stated by the first panel about I'm trying to look at the word that they used on the phantom something or other. Where an email at an email or a name, oh, cyber squatting. Have you ever heard of cyber I've, squatting I've, before? I got a laugh out of that. I just never heard the term before. No, I have no idea about that. We have no, I've never seen any evidence of any cyber squatting or any kind of copying of restaurants to try to take their business. None whatsoever. So Reggie or Irene's Pizza dot com. You're not aware that someone out there is now opening up Irene Pizza dot net. Absolutely not. And staring that business toward Grubhub, Seamless, or any other online provider. I no, absolutely not. Okay. And you mentioned earlier because you know the one that everybody's waiting to hear about is the, uh, as you refer to it, a rare or small group that may have been charged with phone orders mm -hmm. that we've been hearing a lot of uh, right. in the media. Um, where thousands of dollars are now being refunded and some are still fighting the 30, 60 days, how far you can go back. Just for the record, last night at 9.30, um, on the way home, stopped at a restaurant, and the owner came running out. Mark, I want you to talk to me. I understand that there may be a problem with my Grubhub uh, charges. And while I was waiting for my order... She conveniently printed out from, I believe it was August of last year, through date, all the transactions. And I don't know enough, but I just, the first time I've ever seen a Grubhub bill. It was broken down nicely, mm -hmm. percentage and so on and so forth. But then there was a phone order line. And going on the numbers that he quickly, she quickly added up last night, since August, phone line order was nearly $4,500 in fees. I think it'd be helpful uh, to walk Yeah, let me, let me walk you through how we handle that. So mm -hmm. first of all, we work to try to only charge for phone orders that um, are legitimate. Um, we do have a system in place. Um, we do, you've, I'm, I've read the same articles. Um, there's a lot of statements saying like any, there, we have an eight point um, criteria to determine if a phone order is actually in order. So it looks at the length of time. So we look at first um, calls over 45 seconds. We look at as if it was a unique number. We look if it was answered during- What do you mean unique number? Uh, we have a unique number on our app. So that when you pull up a restaurant on Seamless, um, you can hit the phone number. So we look to see if it was that. Um, we look at, was it answered during business hours? 
We don't charge for more than one call a day. So for example, if I made a phone order and then I called, as I think it was written uh, recently, that they're calling to check on uh, the, the status of an order or that to complain about their food, um, that would automatically be kicked out because we don't do more than one per day, per location. Per uh, number, you mean? Uh, yeah, per restaurant. So, you so if a restaurant gets more than one call from a certain number in a day, there would only possibly be one phone order charge for that. There couldn't be, if they called back again, they couldn't be charged again for that. Does Please that elaborate. Sense? Are you saying the, no, the number that's listed on your platform changes, or are you saying No, that no, no. Um, if, if someone calls in a phone order, right? And so it meets the criteria and it's charged as a phone order. Mm -hmm. If they call back later in the day, the same person. Same person. Same number. Same number. That's and they call back later and say, hey, my food was late. We don't charge you again for that. Right? So that's this one of the criteria you look at. So we're not charging multiple times. We want to make sure that the algorithm is intended to make sure that we are not, you know, doing multiple charges for any particular order. And we also make every effort to ensure that it is not a phone order. Um, but Stay on that number, on that one a day. I had a... In my previous life, I was a small business owner. Mm -hmm. uh, my small mom and pop shop, unique service that we offered in real estate, had 10 phone numbers. Not one, it was 10. And you picked up the next available line. Right. Would I be charged? Would, it, would your algorithm using the same 45 second, unique number, business hours, would that uh, come up as a potential charge? phone or to charge use, we use the we have a, a number that we assign on our app or our website and it's only one number right so now i called from the same office mm -hmm. using the same phone but it just comes up with a different number you wouldn't know that five nine seven sixteen hundred is my main number but that line was used now it's five nine seven 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 two nine that the order is coming in from what that call is we are you saying that you have the technology that would prevent that second phone call from the same location with a different phone number using your number would not allow a charge? No, we don't have technology to determine that. But what we do is we look at a number of the different points, right? Is it longer than 45 seconds and all the other points? And if it, um, if it hits all of those criteria, then it then it is charged. So then you can have a second charge from the same location because of a variable in phone numbers, the phone that I pick up, the next line that's available on my end. I suppose it is possible, but it's not Very likely. Um, okay. I, I do want to say, though, that one of the things that we try to do is be completely transparent with the calls. So all of the call orders are on the restaurant statement within five minutes. So mm -hmm. you have immediate access to that. The call recordings are available within 24 to 48 hours. So a restaurant can listen to that at any moment. Um, and the restaurant has up to two months to dispute any calls. Um, that said, our account managers are trained to promptly, you know, address any errors. And we really work on a case-by-case -case basis if they're extenuating circumstances because we want what everybody wants. We want our restaurant partners to be happy. Um, and so we certainly will work with them on that. What the are other the criteria? Because I want to go down. I got stuck on that oh, number sorry. four. Um, it's available within five minutes on the on our no, site. No, place phone order. You said there's an algorithm which takes into calculations you have to be on there more than 45 seconds a unique right. number it was it during business hours during business hours, one yes. per one call per day from that number right subjected to a phone charge what are the other um not a new not a new restaurant which would frequently get a lot of calls like a brand new restaurant so we have a window there that that we would not charge for that as well what's the time frame on that uh, I, do, I do not have the exact time frame, but it's several weeks. Okay. What other factors? Um, those are most of them. The others, uh, I think those are the biggest ones. Okay. There's a few others. So the, art, the last article I saw, a restaurant owner uh, received $10,000 in a refund. Is that 
something I'm sure you've read as well? Uh, I, I'm familiar with that because that had to pass through me to, uh, to be approved. That is a very extenuating circumstance. Uh, the restaurant owner was very unhappy. And like I said, we want to work to, uh, with our restaurant owners to make, it does us no good to make our customers unhappy. Um, and so on that case, we worked out um, a situation that, that they said that they were fine with and happy with. And, um, and then unfortunately it came up um, a few days ago in the paper, so that was interesting. But but I, I would say that you know the, the key point is that we work on a case-by-case -case basis with restaurants if there's something outside the guidelines. But we really feel like having those phone calls available within 24 to 48 hours is key. And um, they have several months, two months, to um, dispute them. And the other point is that in, in working with our restaurants, one of the huge value adds of the recorded calls is that restaurants often would pay for customer service evaluation. And so what we hear many of our restaurants say is that they're listening to the calls. They're listening to the calls for quality service. Like, are they answering properly? Are they polite? Are they upselling? And so we get a lot of restaurant owners tell us that that's something that they would pay extra for, which they don't because they get the phone recordings to listen to them. And we encourage them to listen to those. Can you go back to the 10,000? Uh, you're saying two months to dispute. Did that refund go, was that for 60 days or did that go uh, back? I can't comment on that specific circumstance. Sorry. So I'm trying to get a better understanding. Last night, I didn't know how to answer the question myself to the restaurant who asked me, Mark, I started with them in August. You show me the bills. And I was surprised. I really was. Mm -hmm. So what am I supposed to tell that restaurant today? They should that you could only go back 60 days is my understanding or they can actually call and you'll figure out how to go back further than that. We will we will certainly work on, like I said, a case-by-case -case basis and talk to them about the circumstances of each case. There's a lot of different cases out there, right? So mm -hmm. we want to talk to them and figure out what's the best solution. And, and so well, the, if that person called us, we would have to listen to all the different factors of what was going the, on. I would imagine the best solution for that restaurant, any restaurant, say, hey, go back to the very beginning and you look into my phone charges and tell me whether or not I should be getting a credit for all of the phone charges. That would be the best case solution, I would imagine. We, for the restaurant, not so sure about your business, but for that restaurant. We, we feel they certainly have the right to call anytime and we can talk, talk them through that and listen to the, the issues of the case. But we feel like we're being completely transparent. It's in our agreement with the restaurant and how we do it. Um, and we give, we make everything very transparent for them to see, right? We post the calls within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, they have two months to go through. So we feel like that is very transparent and a appropriate amount of time for the restaurant to challenge anything that they may think is not correct. Prior to the recent media attention, how many people actually went back and listened to recordings? Um, one, one, I guess there's, there's a couple points I want to make on phone orders. In general, phone orders are less than 3% of our, all of our orders. No, I'm with you. How much is right? your it's total? A small, it's a small percentage. What is the total, uh, the total sales that you generate on a yearly basis? Because if it's 3%, I'm going to assume whatever that billions of dollars is, right? It's 3%. That'll give us an idea. It is, it is 3% of all of our order volume. Yeah. Which is what? Uh, last year, dollar amount. It, we're a public company. It was um, right around a billion dollars. A billion dollars. So, what is three percent of a billion dollars? Three hundred million. Thirty million. Huh? Thirty million. It's Thank you. Three percent in New York. In New York. Yeah. I'm sorry. So we don't. Three percent do in New York. We don't do a billion in New York. So that's it's. That's overall. That's ne nationwide. Uh, What's your nationwide so in New York order? phone orders, which is what you know is. Uh, the issue of various like media reports of all the orders in New York, this is less than 3%. So it's either I'm going to ask you now, what is the total sales for New York yeah. or what is the percentage nationwide of phone orders? Right. Right. It's slightly I'll let you answer either slightly, one. It's slightly less than 3% for either. Slightly less than 3%. So we'll say 3% roughly? Okay. okay. So now you're looking at $30 million, correct? Using the one billion dollar total sales, right? Three percent, right. thirty million. Yes. That's the, the amount that you've generated from that source of revenue from phone calls. That's a lot of money. 
right? Yes, and and we want to make sure that phone orders are available for our restaurant partners because we believe it's a valuable way to get orders. So I'm going to ask, what was the percentage of those of that thirty million dollars that has been refunded as of today? I do not have that information. With What's me. the amount of challenges that were received from your restaurant? owners 24 to 40 hours after they were posted to contest the charges we don't we take we take uh, customer service calls from restaurants and from diners and from drivers mm -hmm. because that's a relatively small percentage of our business uh, we don't track that specifically so I don't have a specific number for you All right but 30 million dollars is not small it's mm -hmm. big by anyone's model 30 30 million dollars in addition of revenue I don't think anyone's gonna walk away from that Right, so I'm just trying to get a better understanding when you, when you say it's a very small portion of what you do, mm -hmm. it's thirty million real dollars. Okay, so I'm trying to guess how many refunds or how many challenges have there been made? Because I come from the pizzeria world, and I say no one had time to look at that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, no one would spend the next twenty four hours looking at every phone order and listening to the conversation to see whether it yielded a sale or not. To then call back you to have a conversation with the nine dollar seven dollar six dollar charge that i received it just in the real world we don't the small owners of these eateries really don't have that time would you agree so i'm gonna we get we get many restaurant order owners that listen to them all the time as a part of customer service as a part of auditing we do get we do get quite a few that listen to them I'm going to make an assumption that not too many restaurants go listen to those recordings. That's a fair point. Fair point. So chances are very few are contested because no one knows whether or not they should be contesting. That's the point I'm trying to make. Restaurants are just trying to fill orders and first one in, last one out, and make sure that they can survive another day in this hostile environment of small business. I don't imagine many people are looking at their bills and taking the time out of the day to look at those charges. And I'm sure someone's crunching numbers um, that's made, that made that determination way on. That, hey, we don't expect many phone calls challenging or questioning this. No one has time. Look, the, um, we feel like we built an algorithm that, that makes sense um, to try to f as accurately depict orders as possible. So we, the other fact I want to bring up is that of all the phone calls, less than 35% are actually charged as phone orders. So it's not like every call that comes through is charged as a phone order. So I want to make sure we're clear on that. Okay. So then if I was a real, wanted to be a real genuine partner, and I've done this in my past, if I see that there is a potential for an error, I'm going to go back and I'm going to say, let me try to figure out where else this could be, and I can show you the real partner that I am, and I'm going to have, because I have the ability to do so, listen to all those recordings, make sure that my algorithm wasn't off, that they actually yielded a order that warranted a charge. I would imagine that would be really getting into the weeds of things and making right if there's any wrong on the three percent of your sales or revenues that is um is that something that are you doing now or not doing now in terms of improving the algorithm and improving the way that we charge phone calls yeah going back to poor reg yeah we we regularly iterate on that and we take feedback and i will be staying here for the rest of the day listening to our restaurant partners and ask and understanding what the specific issues are and of course if we hear something that is a good idea or interesting we'll take that back and look at and see what makes best sense i was just told yesterday that he, a person went back looking at the previous bills and they couldn't get into the history they made a phone call you gave them more history they can go back past the 90 days to listen to old recordings and then we would try to go further back and something popped up on their screen that said under review. Didn't say no longer available, but under review, which I thought was Grubhub, seamless. And reviewing all of those phone calls, making the determination that maybe uh, there would have been a glitch in an algorithm, that perhaps there shouldn't have been a charge uh, for a phone call that came in using those five points that you mentioned. 
and someone's figuring out how much has to be returned to our customers, our partners, the restaurants. Is that something that you're aware of is happening? I'm not aware of that. So the restaurants out there, have, if they have time, are encouraged to call you, have a discussion. Policy is no greater than two months to dispute. But if you argue with us, we're willing to extend that. But we don't have a clear indication to how far back. Yeah, we would, we would review the circumstances of each case. And there's nothing that I can tell the restaurants that are going to be calling me for the days and weeks ahead. We encourage them, if they have a problem with what we've done, to reach out to our customer success team and have a conversation. Well, I guess, you know, I have to accept the answer for what it is. I may not like it, but that's your answer. And I'm going to encourage all those restaurants to call back. And I'm going to have to ask them what was their – what were they informed um, were they able to go back as far as their contract started, initiated, and will determine then, based on their input, what I have to get back to you with? So if they're told, sorry, no more than 60 days, I've got to come back and say to you, hey, why are you allowing these small businesses to go back for the last year or since they operated business or they signed an agreement with you to credit them back any charges that perhaps they shouldn't have been charged from the very beginning? That's where we're going to leave it. That's what you're telling me. Yeah, we will, we will listen to what is said today, and we will take that back, and we will, we will determine the best course of action from there. You know, I'm pretty tedious, and I'm going to assure you that there are restaurants out there that are going to be calling me. I'm going to ask them, each and every one of them, what their experience was when they called to challenge the fees. And if they couldn't go back, for more than two months or three months or four months to actually hear the recordings, to make a determination whether or not they should be challenging those fees. I'm going to be coming back. And you're not helping me now because I really want to be the, the right guy here to help both sides and continue a healthy relationship that works. Uh -huh. Okay. I will, take your, I will take your feedback as well. And we will well, my feedback is simple. Go back. Go back to the very first day that that business signed that agreement with you. Assess all of the phone charges that were made. Have someone listen to each and every recording. And if there was a phone charge to that restaurant for an order that never took place, that never yielded in a sale, that you would call them up and say, Hey, Reggie, I got some great news for you. I've got a nice check being refunded to you because of an algorithm problem. That would be a great partnership. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna go back to, um, you answered some of the questions and I just wanna, if it's okay with you, uh, can we do a quick search on names and I just wanna get a better understanding of what's happening out there with, um, with searches on the websites. And let's use that one, and this is why Uber Eats is good for you to be here as well. What was the name of that restaurant there? Can I have it there? I'm doing a basic search of Hanko's Restaurant. And we're just gonna look to see what that shows up. Anybody familiar with Hanko's? Yeah, Vietnamese, Bon Mi. Okay, I'm not, by the way, but yeah. Vietnamese, good. <laughs> Uber? So we're just going to type in Hanko's Restaurant, and I just want to see what appears. And of course, they're going to do this in a font where I'm not going to be able to see, but that's okay. Can you blow that up even more? I can look at it from here, right? You guys are at a disadvantage. All right. So... Uh, that's the top of the list there? Yeah, this is the top of the list. It's a PDF that we saved. Okay. Before. So, under this search, first time user, I'm looking for a specific name. You have no history on me, but I know, I remember Hanko's because I've eaten there before, and I just don't remember their phone number, and I want to place an order. I'm going to see listings from providers, and it starts with Seamless. And then Menu Pages. 
Yelp, Yelp, Open Table, DoorDash, and I can't read the bottom one. Yeah, because it's a PDF. It's a PDF. Okay, could it? All right. And what I'm looking at is roughly ten returns on my search, and only two of them are actually Hankos. The other eight are from providers and platforms such as Uber, Menu, um, Grubhub. If I didn't know any better, they clicked on the first search and it says Hanko's order delivery and I click on that, that yields a, a sale for Seamless. If I do the second one, it's going to Grubhub, which is the same company, correct? And then if I go to the third one, it's actually a taste of Vietnamese. It's actually the owner of that restaurant. The fourth one, if I had glasses, I could tell you. What does that say? Seamless. Seamless again. Just in case, in case you missed number two. You can see them again on number four. And number five? Menu pages. Menu pages. Is it menu pages part of Seamless and Grubhub? Menu Pages is not affiliated at all in any way to Grubhub or Seamless. It is. Okay. What's number six? Yelp. Seven? Yelp. Yelp. Eight? Open Table. Open Table. Nine? DoorDash. DoorDash. Ten? Restaurant again. Uber Eats is not even on here. They don't deliver. Oh, good point. I was going to say, wow, Uber Eats, you've been outdone. Do you find it a little odd that of the 10 searches that result, or the 10 yielded in my search, that was two to Seamless, one to Grubhub, one to Menu, four out of the 10 come back to your platform, and only two out of the 10 actually go directly to that restaurant owner. So when we say driving business, and I was fortunate enough to have the, or Reggie was smart enough to have an online presence and a website and spend the money that he, to generate that website and put up his menu and take the photographs that are needed to promote his businesses and services. But yet, when you search for him directly, he's number three on the list and Seamless and Grubhub come before him. Isn't that unfair for Hanko's? Because had I chosen number three, I could deal directly with the restaurant and have to worry about anyone getting a percentage of their gross sales. Can you help me understand how this relationship works, this partnership? Uh, go ahead. Go. Uh, yeah, I think, I think uh, as Kevin mentioned, we're a marketing platform, and the idea is to push out Hankos to as many people as possible uh, through every channel that we can. And so we have engineers here, a lot of them based here in New York, that work every day to make sure that people know when they, to, they are able to find Hankos, and that's what restaurants pay for uh, when they partner up with us. They want to make sure that we are able to access as many diners as possible. And, and like folks who tell us every day, uh, they don't have the funds to outlay. They don't have computer, en computer engineers on staff or a marketing department or uh, folks that can work with the Google's uh, ads and Google searches and tr try to figure all that out. So they partner up with us. And that's exactly what the service we provide. But in this regard, Hankos did have the insight and invested in a website and try to promote themselves, but yet they're finding their very website at a disadvantage when it comes to the platforms that are out there. Did Hank, does even Hankos have an agreement with you? Are you aware if they're a customer? Or? Every, every restaurant that we, every restaurant on our platform here in New York has an agreement with us. Okay, so if they're not 
if they're not in a in a written agreement with you, their name would never show up on any of your platforms. Yeah, in, in New York, we've we partnered with every restaurant that's on the platform in New York. Yeah. Right, so if they didn't pay and you don't have an agreement, their name would never appear on any of the platforms that you offer. That we offer. Uh, yes. And that means you're affiliates, by the way. Yeah, uh, I'm just saying. I I know this has been an issue, and for other platforms in the industry. Okay. Not. Not, okay. Good. I'm going to go back to that question about. So you've answered everything about this um, taking over of someone's name, and you have no idea. You've never heard of it before, and I didn't. Up until now, I didn't either. You, the contact information you've answered, the customer data, and overcharges uh, or potential charges that shouldn't have taken place. Uh, for phone orders. Is there anything else that, in addition to those percentages that could yield another charge, so besides the 3% for the credit card fees, um, anything else? No. There's an add-on. No. no minimum order, uh, nothing of that nature if the order is below a certain dollar amount? Restaurants can set minimum orders on the on our site. That's their choice. But no, you are, don't know. So if I ordered a slice of pizza from Reggie's Pizza, I'm just going to pay, and his slice is a dollar, I'm not going to pay more than... The restaurant's choice to choose the, the minimum. And they there's no additional fee for you, correct? From a minimum order. You get your 30%. Correct. For the rest, for charging the restaurant? Yeah, that's what the restaurant pays. Okay. It's what? clearly spelled out in our contract. How many pages is your contract? <laughs> get you a copy. You have any idea? I. It's not long. It's not long at all. Yeah, it's pretty. Okay. Hub. Uh, we'll get you a copy. It's not long. Grubhub. I'm sorry. Uh, Uber Eats. Is there a minimum charge? Because we asked the question before. And so the minimum charge is not to the restaurant. Um, it's actually to the customer. So it's not an additional fee to our restaurants, but it's actually an additional fee to our customers mm -hmm. um, if the basket size is too low or if the total order amount is too low. And is that something that Grubhub or Seamless does as well, charge the customer, or is that it? There's no additional fee, flat fee? We, we don't have a, a small order fee, I don't believe. And again, I think as Kevin mentioned, though, like restaurants set the minimum fee. So it's not a lot of times, I believe it's not in their interest to have a small order. They want to have big orders. And so they'll set the minimum high oh, or to whatever works for them. And a lot of them start out high and then they see the business is really good and they'll move it on down. But it's set by the restaurant. How many restaurants do you have in New York City that you're offering your services for? And that would be Seamless Grubhub or any affiliated partner that you have from menu pages and what I can't think of the rest, but whatever they are. You have the number of? We have, a, we have 115,000 approximately total. I do not know the number for New York specifically. And that's Seamless Grubhub or? Yeah. So none of the other affiliates? So un un under the Grubhub platform, yeah, the, uh, all the companies. So yes, correct. Can um, a restaurant negotiate besides the fees that you charge, the terms and conditions of your agreement, or this is your agreement? Yes, they can. Our, our contracts are negotiable. And they're all they, all these fees and charges are outlined in there in yeah. easy to read format. Someone like me who needs glasses doesn't wear them could be able to see them. Yes, correct. Okay. I'm looking forward to seeing that contract. So that's two things you're gonna get to me. Is that 3% fee, is that the fee that you're actually charged from the credit cards or is that the fee that you um, just pass on? So is it a pass-through or is there a little cushion there as well? It covers, it covers the credit card fees, it covers fraudulent orders, undeliverable orders, things like that. So that's the, that's the fee we charge. All right, but that's not the fee, it's not a pass-through? No. So if it was 2% from the credit card and you mark it up by a percent, 
to cover other costs. Correct. Okay. I'll just ask the question. So what's the fee that you are charged from the credit cards? I do not have that specific information with me. That's number three. Okay. What is the average? And you couldn't tell me about the average markup. So um, each of you have established contracts with some of the major chains. So whether it be McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts, I believe, is a recent acquisition, right? Um, I would imagine they're able to negotiate much better deals for themselves because of the sheer number of locations that they have. We can't give contract specifics, but but certainly um, there's national buying power, yes. All right. So if we had a national uh, or a retail association uh, that negotiated for all their clients, would you be sit willing to sit down with them again and renegotiate the fees? We would listen to what they had to say. I mean, there's obviously a lot of variables in that, of what you're saying, but would listen to what you have to say. Good. I'm looking forward to that also because I want to be the right. champion of small business mom and pop shops. Um, and you're also going to let me know how far they can go back on the uh, back orders, correct? Yes. To get a statement to actually listen, and you'll let me know about that, you know, uh, the ability of nuts, it's under review, whatever that indicator is that popped up. Okay. You don't target eaters based on past history, do you? So if I'm accustomed to eating Reggie's Pizza on every Wednesday and one Wednesday I'm not ordering out or I'm not here, I shouldn't get an email reminding me or a text message or geofencing that'll pop up some kind of message to remind me that Reggie's Pizza. Not that I'm aware of. Not that you're aware right. I mean, that's a marketing um, question, but yeah. I don't think so. Oh boy, did I just give you another idea? I hope not. <laughs> and I, I hope it's one that won't yield another charge. Um, is there, are restaurants able to run loyalty programs on your respective platforms? Uh, yes, they are. And part of that, can they negotiate if they ordered both catering and uh, fine dining uh, fees for both? Or is it going to be a standard fee? One of the issues that came up earlier was that if they ordered off-site catering versus um, single order, you offer the same charges, there's no renegotiating on... You mean adding adding catering to their existing... Well, they're going to place an order, and it's going to be, I need catering for 30 people. Uh, and that includes the dishware, the silverware, and coffee cups, and everything else that I'm going to order. Your contract... Does it take into consideration these larger orders, or is it going to be the same uh, percentage points that was negotiated across the board, whether it be a single order of pasta or a catering event for 30 people? Um, it would depend on the contract that was originally negotiated. So if um, circumstances change, then certainly the question can be asked about renegotiating. You're not aware of anyone that has that type of an arrangement with you now? Not specifically, but we could certainly check on that. Yeah. So I'm not going to keep you here anymore on the, the panel. I think you've answered everything that you possibly could in a format that you wanted to, but there's certainly more testimony that we're going to hear from some of our restaurant owners. And I just want to, and again, up until today, I haven't heard it. Retaliation is one of those things that I frown upon, and um, I really would hate to hear from a restaurant that their online orders have fallen um, because they appeared or submitted some type of testimony. I, I want to make it very clear that mm. there is uh, that fear is unfounded. That will not happen. It has never happened. We've been in business for 20 years. Uh, we've operated with tens of thousands of restaurants. That's not something we would ever 
ever do. Uh, and, and I would add, too, that we're staying until the end of the hearing, and we're prepared to meet with everyone. I have my notepad, pen, business card, cell phone, senior vice president, and we'll work through any issue that anyone has in this room. I appreciate that. You know, I, not that I want to mimic Colombo, but something just came back to mind. You know, he's about to, <laughs> and he turns around, he remembers something. Um, one of the things that uh, was brought to my attention is the actual business model and how it started. I believe initially it was a modest 10% fee. Is that how the model began? It was offered to Wall Street, and then they expanded to the open markets? Yeah, I think it started off with, but I, I, I think, are you getting at, like, the increase in fees over time? Yeah. yeah I, think, I think we can speak to that because uh, of all the services that came with the mm -hmm. fees and how those commissions were reinvested in the restaurant network. Yeah, so, so yes, over time, our, our fees have increased a few percentage points, um, but our orders have actually outpaced that by the size of the orders by a significant amount. We've also invested heavily in the restaurants, so we have invested in marketing. We've spent over um, $60 million in the last several years to promote our restaurants on our platform and offer discounts to diners and things like that. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars on advertising, again, to drive demand for the smaller restaurant. We build our, we build our um, app to be, have more self-service tools so that they can update their menus, they can add photography. So we've reinvested all of that to increase the, the diners and the new diners coming to our restaurants. The reason I bring that up, in one of the meetings that I had um, early on, customer, um, saw the immediate advantage going back to the early days and the fees that would be in charge. And I believe he said it was upward of 10, 12%. I don't remember the number now. And based on the relationship that you had, your platform became an integral part of his business model. And you've flourished. As you continue to flourish, the fees kept going up. And the last comment from him was simple. Mark, with Grubhub and Seamless, the online platforms that we have, for me and my business, it's a slow death. Without them, it's an instant death. They came into my place of business like a Trojan horse and have taken over my entire business model. I didn't know how to respond. I mean, one, you know, we work with restaurants every day. And we work, this business works with restaurants every day. And so we need restaurants uh, in ways, and these industries need each other. And so that's why we have Kevin and his restaurant success team to make sure that restaurants are not going through the slow death. And over the course of time, especially over the last few years, reinvesting in the restaurant network, tripling the restaurant success team, providing them with new technology like tablets, free of charge. We're making sure that orders increase. And we've seen year over year that yeah. the order size has increased, the volume has increased, and the revenues have increased. But if restaurants feel that they have an issue, that's why we have the restaurant success team to make sure that we're addressing all those issues. And that's why we're going to stay to the end of the hearing. And, and there's one other, if, if I may. Please. There was one other example. We, we met with one of our restaurant partners this morning, and he, he walked us through kind of the progression with Grubhub over time. And he said, we are doing more than $2 million a year in orders. Thank you very much. You, we appreciate what you've done for us. So. Kevin, did you ask him if he's making more money now at the end of the, mo yes. at the, end of the year? Yes. Does he show yes. a bigger profit? Yes. Okay, it's interesting. I'd like to meet that. My last, um, I promise, this is it. Um, there's also a fear and a speculation that online platform delivery service apps are potentially um, operating in partnership today with someday opening up what they call dark kitchens. See, the idea is that perhaps someday if the continued growth of online orders you no longer need a brick and mortar you don't need to be on park avenue and broadway out here because you're not going to rely on foot traffic anymore uh, as your apps continue to grow in usage 
and as you continue making deliveries, and whether through partnership of Uber Eats or anyone else, is there a fear that someday we'll have operators out of a second floor, third floor, warehouse, or basement conversion with a simple kitchen, no seats, no service offered, where your platform will be the means and the fear is that you'll actually be an owner of that dark kitchen with no name, don't need one, because someone's out there is buying dot net and dot this and dot that um, and coming up with the phantom entities and you've put poor Irene's pizza out of business and I don't mean you, I'm painting an ugly picture here. Although she owned that business for generations and put everything into it that Irene's Pizza is no longer Irene's. That there's someone making something like Irene's Pizza and they're ordering it through a third party online platform from another kitchen. Is this something that's even conceivable? This is not part of our business plan, for sure. But is it conceivable? Yeah, I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd say this again, the re these industries need each other and there'll always be restaurants um, and you, <laughs> you're always gonna need places to go. A and what we've seen is the data shows that delivery actually encourages more dine-in customers. Mm. We're, we're not cannibalizing dine-in experience. We're actually driving more customers to through restaurant doors and having that dine-in experience. Yep. And that's kind of where I think, again, like these, re these industries complement one another. We're providing incremental orders, new customers, both delivery and dine-in. But as I ask the question, can that scenario ever happen? I don't see a scenario where uh, there are no restaurants as part of restaurant delivery. In particular, Irene's Pizza. Can you see Irene's Pizza being operated by a ghost that's using your platform that undermines Irene, similar to the restaurant we just saw, that their own website is nowhere to be found, or two out of the ten choices are actually going directly to that restaurant? Yeah, we're a marketing tool for a restaurant. So, like, we're working with Irene. We sit down, we enter in an agreement with Irene to drive orders to Irene's Pizza, not only on delivery, again, but also customers that get attracted to Irene's Pizza through our platform and then go visit Irene's Pizza, which is across the street, I believe, from Reggie's Pizza. Correct. And, Yo, uh, you've been there before. <laughs> okay. I found it on Seamless. And, <laughs> but that, that's the crux of the business model. And, that's, and it, again, a lot of this is not new. We've been in business for 20 years here in New York, and the restaurant industry has grown with us, and we've grown with the restaurant industry. And the online, and the, um, again, never hearing this before, the possibility of uh, antitrust and monopolizing. How much do you, what is the market share that you guys have now? Is it somewhere in the 80% of all online orders or in New York City are being done? I think there, that, there's a lot of competition. We do not have a majority yeah. of the market share <laughs> nationally. Yeah, and I'd, again, I'd say this. Uh, I think there was a question of monopoly. Yeah, and, that's what I'm referring to. And uh, retaliation and uh, setting up dummy accounts or having extra fees. Again, we've been in business 20 years, openly and transparently, here in New York City. We've operated with tens of thousands of restaurants. In mm -hmm. fact, the industry has gotten more players than they do now in the last four years than the previous 16. And so I'm not clear what the monopoly... How many, how many companies have you acquired in, in 23 years? 20 years. Um, I'm not sure on the number, but I was speaking to the fact that w there's more competition, uh, specifically, for example, the person to my right. Uh, there's DoorDash. Postmates, Caviar, a number of companies that are in this space. So I think the competition has only gotten uh, increased over time, not decreased, which is the opposite of what a monopoly trend would look like. Does anyone that has affiliates have more than 50% of the market of online orders? 
of total online orders across the country? No, no. Let's talk about New York first, and then more about the country. Because I'm not sure what the market share is I don't in New have York. Specific New York data. I I would say yeah, nationally for sure. Yeah, I, I don't know what the market share is in New York, but I do know that we've been here 20 years, and we're we take pride in the fact that we're the iconic takeout brand for New York. And again, the the issue is we need to work with restaurants. And we've done so for the last 20 years, and we've helped restaurants grow, and we have a number of restaurant owners that will speak to that. Fortunately, a lot of them couldn't be here today, but we will make sure that we will connect you and the Small Business Committee with them. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Uber, thank you for your patience. The next panel is... Steve Bulger from the U.S. Small Business Administration, SBA. Center. There you go. I knew it wasn't working. Uh, on behalf of my boss, uh, SBA Regional Administrator Steve Bulger, who oversees all of our cabinet-level agencies' federal operations throughout New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, the following is uh, Regional Administrator Bulger's testimony for this proceeding's official record and for your consideration. Good afternoon, council members and participants in today's committee hearing. Thank you, uh, Chairman Jonai and council members for inviting me to testify on this important matter. I appreciate the opportunity to share my comments. Uh, while official duties elsewhere in the region, namely upstate, prevent me from physically being here in person like I was yesterday, I uh, would like to express my deep thanks for allowing our federal agency to participate today. As SBA Regional Administrator overseeing agency operations in New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, I'm committed to the priority of ensuring small business owners and entrepreneurs see SBA as the go-to resource for counseling and funding opportunities no matter what stage of life cycle their business is in. Together with our lending and resource partners across the five boroughs and in communities across New York and the entire Atlantic region, we can continue to help drive our economy. Productively collaborating on initiatives to help the New York City small business community is a testament to the productive bipartisan relationship I've developed with Councilman Jonai. What impresses me most is that Councilman Jonai understands, like I'm hopeful every member of this committee and the entire council does, that small businesses and hardworking entrepreneurs are the lifeblood of our economy. However, those are more than just words. It's the God's honest truth. One of my colleagues in Washington recently asked me if we could go one day without a dozen small businesses impacting our lives. What about just one small business? If you try answering those questions yourself, the answer is a resounding no. Small business is woven into the fabric of the United States and the city of New York. Small businesses are everywhere. Your dry cleaners, the independent coffee house you frequent, your doctor's and dentist's office, and most importantly today, your favorite local restaurants. They are all undoubtedly small businesses. With SBA's participation in today's hearing and our collaborative work with the committee, this actually marks the first time the city council and the federal government are working together to assist the New York City small business community. It's a much needed step in the right direction and, quite frankly, what small business owners deserve. But what is a small business? A small business is defined by the federal government as any commercial venture with 500 or fewer employees. 
These types of companies make over 99% of businesses throughout the nation, while micro businesses or those businesses with less than 20 employees constitute close to 90% of them. And the New York restaurant industry is a mosaic of thousands of small businesses indeed. It is an economic engine that revs on what the National Restaurant Association estimates to be the daily operations and revenues of over 24,000 restaurants across the city of New York's 12 congressional districts. That immense number of small businesses encapsulates 48.3% of all of New York State's restaurants. By the numbers, almost half the Empire State's restaurant establishments, small businesses by definition, are located right here in the five boroughs. What's more, these numbers consist of both the table and limited service segments of the restaurant industry. While small businesses like restaurants do not need to register with the SBA or the federal government to operate, the figures quoted above are the most accurate numbers of small business-sized restaurants in the city that we at the SBA actually have. Strangely, these figures are not from the city or any local government entity. It was actually quite productive to hear the uh, SBS officials up here. But these figures come from a restaurant industry group. Why? Because neither the City of New York nor the Department of Small Business Services actually requires restaurants to, or small businesses to register with the city or that department in order to operate. So no exact count is actually possible. Nevertheless, the SBA stands ready, willing, and able to assist small business owners and entrepreneurs grow their ventures and create jobs by providing resources and tools like access to capital. It is a proven time-tested way to create a blueprint for, econ for an economy built to last. SBA achieves this through several methods, but specifically access to capital, from the smallest needs in micro-lending to substantial debt and equity investment capital. We also power small business owners to uh, know of opportunities in federal contracting, access to entrepreneurial education, and disaster assistance. In fact, the SBA helps build a more supportive environment for entrepreneurship and innovation day in and day out. We're not a federal regulatory agency like our colleagues at Justice or the Commerce Departments, but rather an advocacy agency that supports our small business community. In fact, the SBA Office of Advocacy and, in our case, our SBA Regional Advocate, regularly meets with small business owners of every industry you can think of to hear their frustrations of overlapping laws and excessive government regulations. They are always eagle, eager to listen and to help uh, to, that the, uh, to the extent the law allows by bringing small business owners and governments to the table to talk in order to help local commerce thrive. Our federal agency consistently acts to better support the efforts of entrepreneurs which spur job creation, drive competitiveness and innovation, and strengthen the national economic uh, ability for growth. Since fiscal year 2011, the SBA has guaranteed 870 7A loans, totaling more than $353 million to the New York City small business uh, community, specifically in the restaurant industry. That's eight years, an eight-year period of time, $353 million, uh, including $50 million in SBA guaranteed loans from last year, January 1st, 2018, to present. That's about 14% of the uh, total number I just cited. 7A loans are our agency's primary program for providing financial assistance to small businesses. They enable small business owners and entrepreneurs to reduce risk and enable easier access to capital. The type of 7A loan dictates the SBA guarantee percentage and the maximum loan amount. Those figures are actually quite impressive compared to the rest of the nation. Uh, they've helped uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of small business owners, many who could be here today, start, grow, and expand just in the past few years here in the nation's largest city. But the SBA also assists businesses and individuals in disaster recovery. Here in New York City, the most recent large-scale activity of this function came after Hurricane Sandy battered the shoreline and decimated many communities. But we actually have SBA disaster assistance personnel right now in Kings County in Brooklyn today providing aid and assistance to victims of an April apartment fire that displaced a large amount of residents. In both cases, SBA and our ODA were right on the ground helping effective homeowners and small business owners recover from day, uh, starting on day one. We do this as well as 
help with capital access by offering low interest long term loans, specifically in disaster assistance to replace real estate, personal property, machinery and equipment, inventory, and business assets that had been damaged or destroyed by the declared disaster. Specifically in Sandy's aftermath, 122 restaurants in the affected area received $21.125 million in affordable, timely, and accessible financial assistance from the U.S. Small Business Administration in one event. However, like any agreement an individual or entity enters with the United States, the federal government is the primary debtor for repayment. Our SBA back, uh, back loans get repaid first. That's part of any agreement anyone signs with the federal government. And that's uh, one of our agency's prime interests here today, ensuring our SBA back loans can be repaid in the face of higher and higher fees tacked on the cost of doing business in New York City by third-party companies. However, the hidden costs of doing business in America's most populated city are actually shameful. Many of them are imposed by Mayor de Blasio and his administration without foresight or thought, but rather on a political whim or for political expedience. That's just not a way to govern. The city preliminary budget, for example, that was proposed by the mayor earlier this year, saw a $3 billion increase in expenditures in making up the $92.2 billion fiscal document for fiscal year 2020. That represents an actual 23% hike in spending since Mayor de Blasio took office, and that budget is actually larger than the individual budgets of 46 of the states in the union. In addition to property taxes, where does all the money the city has, where does it come from? I'm not a city finance specialist by any means, but have spoken to hundreds upon hundreds of small business owners during my tenure as regional administrator. The archetypical mom and pops who see this, these fees, the higher and higher spending coming from their bottom line. Fines slapped on small mom and pop stores, often on a whim, are just quick revenue raisers to pay for an ever expanding and expensive municipal government. Earlier this year, this city council rightly took action to stem a mayor's office scheme by passing the Awnings Act, and after an overzealous building department official began a panic among small business owners uh, in the uh, small business community by issuing tickets in the amounts ranging between $4,000 and $8,000 for each case of supposed improper store signage violations. Again, that's not a way to govern, do business, or lead. In a recent New York Daily News op-ed, one of your city council colleagues, Chairman Councilman Justin Brannon from South Brooklyn, joined the New York State Senator and the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce President in rightly saying that New York City businesses were on the brink. They could not have been more correct. Technology companies, such as the topic of this hearing today, appertaining to food delivery apps like Grubhub, Uber Eats, Door, excuse me, DoorDash, Postmates, and Caviar, just to name a few, uh, there are stories upon stories and some empirical evidence uh, and, and concern uh, that actually correlates with this hypothesis. The usage of this technology is an immensely added cost of doing business in America's largest city. It is incumbent upon local government and municipalities to stand up for their economic engines and take the appropriate and necessary steps to ensure the small business community remains whole, not preyed upon by predatory companies and third-party vendors. Fairness is key. Fairness is paramount. Stories like one that was just cited in the panel before, taking $10,000 in fees from just one restaurant over a period of time and then refunding it shows that something may actually be wrong. Just as obtaining capital and financing is the requirement to show viability of a small business as it's needed for a myriad of reasons, growth, new equipment, staff, investment opportunities, and so forth. Its counterpoint is the revenue from its operations, the money from the goods and services purchased by the general public. When revenue is significantly lowered due to artificial factors such as predatory delivery-related expenses controlled not by a company but by a third-party vendor, the downward spiraling of economics of running a restaurant, dining, a dining establishment, or bar in the city of New York and elsewhere across the region, and my region and country, unfortunately and sadly, continues. Food delivery apps, the subject of today's committee hearing, are supposed to help small businesses and entrepreneurs market their product and themselves to new customers and eaters every second of every day. That, at least, was the original intent. 
They were envisioned to be a supplementation of the classical small business or restaurant model, an added bonus, if you will, for restaurateurs, chefs, foodies, and consumers alike who, us- who utilize them, connecting good food with the very people looking for it 24-7. Again, that was the intent. Today, that may be and could very well be a reality of being very far from the case. These third-party companies charge a user fee on both ends to the consumer the consumer utilizing them as well as small businesses offering their goods through their service. Numerous small business owners have shared this concern with our office and the Office of Advocacy. A valid point shared by small restaurants is that these companies are taking too much from their bottom line in an already overregulated and taxed business atmosphere. Small business margins in the restaurant industry are, as everyone in this room must know, very slim compared to other industries. The overwhelming majority who have approached the SBA and me at meetings and through our district offices have spoken about high fees from a $10 to $15 connection fee, as discussed in the panel before uh, and covered in local media, uh, where someone calls a restaurant or bar through the delivery app on their cell phone, perhaps for information or to see if special arrangements could be made, but orders nothing, to monthly user fees, uh, plus an additional dollar to dollar fifteen charged to restaurants for a customer making a reservation on different apps uh, other than those here today, like Open Table, for example. That's not even mentioning the API integration fees for any third-party software integration, which is often, uh, also often an additional fee of hundreds of dollars placed upon a small business owner and their enterprise. Well, neither the SBA nor I will provide commentary or speculate on the business models of these technology companies or applications. We will, however, take the side of the overburdened, overtaxed, and overregulated small business owners who operate in New York City, the nation's largest. And we will stand with our small business owners and entrepreneurs, as I did yesterday. These 25,000 New York City restaurateurs who employ 300. 30,500 people, according to the National Restaurant Association, again, they employ over 330,000 New Yorkers, also happen to face a hostile, unjust business atmosphere chock full of fines and red tape that negatively impacts their bottom line day in and day out. But that's, a, I guess, a topic for another day and another hearing. According to a recent Gallup poll, everybody knows Gallup, Online food delivery companies have a market share of, like the chairman cited, 84% of United States adults ordering delivery or takeout at least one time a month. That's Gallup polls. That's not the industry number. That's a Gallup poll that's publicly available. But in terms of census data, that's about 84% to 284 million people aged 18 and above. That's an immense, immense number. One potentially reaching an antitrust threshold, which was mentioned before, that could be uh, considered by the Justice or Commerce Departments. Again, SBA is not an enforcement agency. However, as a federal cabinet level agency, it's our position that small business owners must be informed about the costs and risks associated with all fiscal operations and decisions in terms of business operations, especially when it comes to fees or interest rates. No industry, organization, or complementary government grew up. I'm sorry. These figure, uh, these figures, be it fee, uh, user fees, prepayment, processing, delivery fees, or so on, should be provided up front with an entrepreneur so they can assess whether it's in their best interest to utilize the service that is charging them. And third-party vendors should not be preying upon their customers who must then have only one choice, passing costs on to consumers. No, indi- uh, no industry organization or complementary government group that we know of is privy to the exact fee structure utilized by restaurants using third-party vendor delivery apps. But as an aside, we're happy you're getting the boilerplate contract. I will let the regional administrator know that. But <laughs> from uh, conversations with small businesses who have reached out to our en- uh, agency due to uh, negative applications to their own bottom line, it appears as if the fees charged by 
third-party technology apps may vary business to business. It's an indeed worrisome, and it worries the SBA that there's no debt pricing standard, but instead what appears to be an ad hoc one negatively infecting, neg- negatively affecting mom and pop stores throughout the diverse neighborhoods that make up the city of New York. What we do know anecdotally, however, is that overly burdened fees cut heavily into small business margins. Yet, as previously indicated, these app delivery models have become so widespread that restaurants more or less need to participate in them in order to stay relevant, stay noticeable, and be accessible to patrons. And the fees and rising costs of doing business in the city of New York do not need to be attributable solely to delivery apps. Overzealous local government seeking to raise revenue often penalizes companies for simply keeping their doors open and operating, hurting job creators who add heavily to our local, regional, and national economies. And while many food retailers struggle, especially in the city of New York where they're faced with sky-high rents, Astronomical real estate prices, if they're looking to buy, bug for the agency, even with the help of an SBA-backed 504 loan, new minimum wage requirements, supposed groundbreaking employee laws, dwindling foot traffic due to new traffic patterns, and outdated Moses-era planning, small businesses now have to contend with third-party technology apps charging non-uniform fees for unspecified usage of their products. We've heard it time and again from entrepreneurs. It's a brave new world out there. The New York City restaurant industry is known worldwide for its flexibility. But these predatory fees are placing an undue hardship on small businesses, many here today. From the textbook mom and pop storefront operations to slightly larger small businesses with a handful of locations employing several dozen workers or more. From Staten Island in the Bronx to Queens, Brooklyn, and Manhattan. That's why it will be refreshing to hear from a spate of small business owners themselves speaking about their own experiences with uh, these technological applications. But let me be clear. Fees charged by food delivery apps are akin to predatory lending, most often than not. Not only is it costly and pervasive in in the industry, but they set up their users for failure, occasionally and most oftenly burdening them with high user fees for even the simplest of things, such as making a phone call. These fees prey on small business owners seeking to expand their restaurant's reach and add to the daily cost of doing business. It is incumbent on this body to determine if this passes what we call the smell test in your municipality. All of these stressors that small businesses face operating in the city of New York are worsened by the fees charged by food delivery apps. Therefore, it's no surprise that in the first quarter of 2019, that marked the 12th consecutive quarter of shrinking year-over-year traffic for broad, for the uh, foot traffic for the broader restaurant industry. That's not me coming up with that figure. That's the Wall Street Journal publishing statistics from U.S. restaurant tracker Miller Pulse. The issue of restaurant fees, uh, the issue of fees, rather, charged by technology companies to small business for use of their food delivery applications is one that should be scrutinized by local government. And I applaud uh, Chairman Jonai and this committee for doing so. I stand ready and willing to partner with the council, Speaker Corey Johnson, Chairman Jonai, and individual council members to achieve one hopefully overarching goal offer a more small business friendly environment and atmosphere in the city of New York and assist the mom and pop small businesses, including those in the restaurant and hospitality industry here today, thrive. Also, if you'd like to work on an issue, partner together, or take advantage of the programs, trainings, or mentorings provided through our resource partners for your, uh, in anybody's community here in the city, Do not hesitate to reach out to me in my office. The SBA regional office is headquartered a block and a half away from City Hall and this building right here. We're at 26th Federal Plaza on the 31st floor. Our phone number is on www.sba.gov in the regional or district office. And on behalf of Regional Administrator Bolger, I thank you very much. I want to thank you for that fully embodied uh, testimony that is now part of the record and um, the challenges that we have ahead of us are going to require city, state, and federal agencies working together to improve the small business environment 
that's under siege and under threat. We see it in our commercial corridors, the number of vacancies. Of the $353 million that SBA has loaned out, do you see an increase in default rates? Is there anything that you can share with us that would be alarming? I do not have those numbers myself. Uh, those would be handled by the New York District Office and the uh, SBA Office of Disaster, Assist- of Disaster Assistance, the ODA. Nothing comes to mind. I've been with the agency now since December. Nothing comes to mind as being flagged as uh, standing out or uh, being noticeable. Uh, I'm personally unaware. I can look into that and get that to you, sir, as well as the committee as a whole. Or Reggie, you know, <laughs> either or. You, you uh, also mentioned uh, in your testimony antitrust potential violations. Are you aware of anything that should be brought to our attention? We are not aware. That would not, be, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the small, U.S. Small Business Administration is not an enforcement agency. Uh, we're an advocacy agency. We uh, back uh, primarily back loans uh, in private money. We uh, give them the SBA guarantee, meaning we've reviewed a small business owner or entrepreneur's business plan. Uh, they've gone through uh, multiple levels of counseling. So uh, with our resource partners, many of whom people here must have heard of, like SCORE or Women's Business Centers or VBOC Veterans Business Owned Centers, um, yeah, so there's a threshold they have to meet to make us comfortable backing a loan. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't been made aware of anything, but, uh, you know, uh, that you're asking. But Have was. these borrowers of SBA funds uh, from SBA, have they brought to your attention any potential issues with their future as they integrate with these online platform providers? No, but what gives the regional administrator pause and uh, what uh, he's illustrated to me in our conversations in the office, uh, if the federal government is the primary debtor, people have to repay their loan to satisfy the SBA guarantee. Uh, so we're off the hook, and they can go on their uh, way to prosperity, if you will, um, small business prosperity. Um, if there are additional factors, you know, uh, impacting loan, for, exa- uh, for, for example, uh, we've gotten multiple reports uh, out of the con- uh, out, out of around the country uh, for the fintech industry and how there are several companies of which I won't mention any to get in trouble that are just direct debiting uh, folks, you know, daily receipts. Uh, taking money out of their account immediately to satisfy, you know, their startup fees that they would have gotten from a, you know, from a bank or, you know, through a bank with the SBA guarantee if they they met the SBA application for a 7A loan. But they went to, a, you know, whatever online lender and they were just debiting them uh, daily. That, if they had an SBA loan, that would greatly interest us like it does here. Uh, you know, where a uh, tech company is taking out a percentage, uh, no matter what the business owner has done, because they're on the hook uh, for an SBA loan. And uh, it's not like we're giving out taxpayer money, but the taxpayers are certifying that the federal government knows what's a solid business and how a loan will be repaid, even if it's uh, a personal obligation to do so. Sorry for that long-winded answer. No, no. I want to thank you. Your testimony is, uh, has been submitted in writing, and we're going to now take all this in consideration and figure out what we can do collectively. Thank so you very thank much. You. And uh, I hope you'll sit around for the other testimony. Absolutely. We have a uh, strict 445 uh, policy, uh, or 5 o'clock policy, because I'm not eligible for overtime, but uh, I will stick around as long as I can. Well, Matt, welcome to my world. I don't get paid <laughs> overtime either. I know. It's it, totally different. I, Again, I joined in December. Uh, I was not a federal employee before that, but uh, it's a unique experience. I can tell you that. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, sir. Can we see who's here that is signed up to testify with a show of hands? I just want to make sure we have enough here. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Can we have um, all six of you come up, and I think we'll find a seat for you. Can you have... We'll just add two additional seats. Thank you.
in no particular order. Uh, how about we start the ladies first? Please introduce yourself and if you're affiliated with any particular company. Uh, oh, press the uh, red oh. button. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for asking me to testify. My name is Jenny Romer. And I'm here today on behalf of Upstream, a nonprofit organization working to spark innovation, innovative solutions to the plastic pollution problem. Uh, New York City is one of the best food scenes in the world, and so much of the world's cuisine is at your fingertips, and the food delivery companies put it all within your reach. There's so much to choose some and it, from, and it's so convenient but convenience comes at a cost. With all the th uh, throwaway plastic cutlery and napkins, all the stuff that you don't actually need, not to mention the bags and single-use containers that come as a matter of course. Uh, now think about this, uh, these same actions repeating millions of times a day for the people living in, in New York, day after day, year after year. The city currently spends more than $6 million each year to manage unwanted packaging, much of it food packaging. Uh, but the good news is that innovation is happening right now. All over the world, businesses, institutions, commun communities are saying no to disposable packaging and designing reuse systems that are convenient and sustainable. We're developing a throwaway free model and it could happen right here. I wanted to share a couple of um, stories to paint a picture of what the future could look like. Jenny, in Portland, Oregon. Jenny, I want to maybe you can help me. We're talking about the online food order, and I think I don't want you to start promoting your products. Um, okay, talk uh, to me I'm not promoting some. a particular product, but I will. I'll get to the point a little bit. But there are a couple of things we're talking about: the future of of food delivery in New York City. And so, think two things that we're really specifically uh, asking for. I work for an organization that's focused on plastic pollution, and I'm I've been involved for the last eight years with plastic pollution in New York City. I wrote the I helped. I was pro bono counsel of the council member Lander and Chin on the bag law, uh, which does does not apply to restaurants currently. But um, we really wanted to look at innovation and to work with businesses to solve these issues. One one thing uh, is really having an opt in system to getting all of the extra utensils and everything that comes with all the food delivery orders as a we as an easy way to address plastic pollution and as a way to save businesses money too. They if they're paying for the thing that they're providing that's just getting throw thrown away. So an easy option that we've seen in other places is just requiring it to be an opt in. So when you're ordering, you check a box that you do want utensils rather than opting out, which usually doesn't Ha doesn't get paid attention to anyway. So for, for everyone in the room, that's just one thing. And then another thing is to really to have a, a pilot program focusing on reusable containers. Uh, there is a demand. I know myself when I worked at a corporate law firm and had a stipend for ordering food, I didn't because I didn't want to have all of the plastic that I couldn't avoid. Um, and so having some kind of a pilot project with one of the delivery companies um, to maybe have a just a very specific area that was covered, specific restaurants where there was a reuse option to maybe pay a deposit of a dollar or two and get that um, deposit back when you returned it. So um, I will not go into the rest of my spiel, but those are two things that we like, really like to look into. And we look forward to working with council members, with the Department of Sanitation, and hopefully with delivery services as well. So Jenny, I want to thank you, and we should actually meet in the near future and we can follow up on those two proposals. I think the opt-in one is something that can be done instantly, and I think it would go a long way, but should there's be, certainly there's much to do on that issue as well. Thank, thank you, Jenny. There we go. Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Riley. I'm the New York City Government Affairs Coordinator for the New York State Restaurant Association. We are a trade group representing food and beverage establishments in New York City and state. We are the largest hospitality trade association in the state, and we've advocated on behalf of our members for over 80 years. Our members are one of the largest and most widely impacted constituencies in the city, as nearly every agency regulates some aspect of this industry. To ensure the continued viability of the restaurant industry, New York City must prioritize regulations that enable these hardworking New Yorkers to continue earning their livelihoods. Today, I'm here to speak about the impact of third-party delivery platforms on the restaurant industry. First and foremost, we want to acknowledge that the modern restaurant industry has come to rely heavily on delivery as a means of getting food to customers. 
We know that third-party delivery platforms have taken on a major role in this model, and oftentimes it's practical for restaurants to work with delivery platforms rather than hire their own delivery workers. With this in mind, we want to advocate for a mutually beneficial relationship between restaurants and delivery platforms and to ensure that clarity, fairness, and profitability are all able to coexist in this relationship. We are hopeful today that restaurants will all fully embrace the opportunity to share their experiences with third-party delivery platforms so we can have a more complete understanding of the status quo. I know we heard from a restaurant earlier today. I have at least one more today, and hopefully there's some written testimony as well. It would be great. Um, anecdotally, we know that restaurants have various types of fee structures, uh, may have a presence on more than one delivery platform, and may have mixed experiences using them. But before we begin to suggest any improvements for the relationship between restaurants and these platforms, we want to hear a number of first-hand accounts. That being said, one issue that came to our attention earlier this year had to do with fees being mistakenly charged on phone calls that were not orders. I know we discussed this a little bit earlier today. Um, based on the experience of one of our board members, who's actually sitting to my left, we learned that some phone calls, typically those lasting longer than about 45 seconds, were being improperly classified as orders. In fact, they were all sorts of calls, including questions about the menu, making a reservation, or other inquiries. Unfortunately, the only way to verify whether or not a call was actually an order is to check back through the phone call log, which is a time-consuming task. That being said, we urge all restaurants who use third-party delivery platforms to do this kind of audit so we can understand how widespread this issue truly is. We suspect that this problem is simply the product of a mistaken procedure, and we'd like to work together to find a good solution. We also hope to hear more from both restaurants and delivery platforms on this topic, and have started to do so today, because as of now, we're working off of limited information from a few cases. In conclusion, the New York State Restaurant Association is committed to a profitable and cooperative relationship between restaurants and third-party delivery platforms. We hope that this hearing will provide the opportunity to gather more information about the status quo, from there, we plan to be active and collaborative participants in making this relationship the best it can be. We appreciate your attention today and your patience and applaud your focus on these crucial and interconnected industries. We look forward to continued efforts to create a clear, fair, and flourishing business environment for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, if it's okay, because I think you are part of the board, oh, yes. a follow-up to that story, and then thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marco Shirico. I'm from uh, Anno Tech on Court in Brooklyn. I also have another establishment uh, disclose. Um, so a few months ago. Say your name again, Mark, please. Mark. Uh, Marco Shirico. C H I R I C O. <laughs> uh, a few months ago, uh, I, um, I've been with Grub Up Seamless uh, for a number of years, uh, about almost five years. Um, and I never increased my. My percentage, I always kept it the same. Um, and uh, over the past last few months, uh, I was actually overlooking a recent order. Uh, I wanted to look up a receipt. And I've noticed these phone charges that, you know, I saw a commission on it. And um, so I raised the red flag and I looked over it. And uh, when looking through it, because I never got actually, um, <clears throat> I never realized before they can actually listen to the call. Um, most of the calls were non-orders. Um, one of the calls were a customer that usually orders off from us all the time, and um, it was a catering order. So I got nine charged nine dollars and eight cents on that order. Uh, to look into it more, I called the customer my personally because we know them. They order from us all the time, and I said, "How'd you?" Um, call us. How'd you find you know find a number because we were charged a commission from Grubhub? Did you go on Grubhub site and call from there? She said simply, I just googled you guys. Uh, I didn't remember a number and I called you. So again, I raised a red flag. I looked over my past orders. Um, tried to go back a few months. I couldn't go past a certain amount of months. Um, within those time month frames, I looked over the orders. I listened to calls. Uh, again non-orders people call them to check on their delivery check on uh if they can add something or if they can if we had something off the menu that they can add again charged a certain amount of money uh all different estimates three dollars forty cents to nine dollars and eight cents um uh after that after that looking over it um i let the new york restaurant association know and then there has been a bunch of other people 
call them back and, and let us know that it's happening to them the same. Uh, we reached out to Grow Papa Seamless. Uh, haven't heard back from them, from those orders. Uh, I know they said they're great customer care, but on those issues, after sending them the, the phone orders and receipts, we haven't heard back or haven't had an apology either on the commissions that they were taking. Those commissions help pay my rent, help pay my employees, help pay other expenses that we need to survive and, and go through those businesses, uh, as a daily business every day. As you saw the numbers before, eight, six, eight percent is our profit zone. Taking 15% to 20% hurts us. Deliveries, you don't make, you make pennies on deliveries. You, you, you pay labor, you pay food costs, menu pricing, the rent, uh, plastic wear, paper wear, all your expenses goes into the delivery. So after 15, 20% taken from your order, you're not making anything. Um, on top of that, you cannot change your pricing from a grub up menu to your, uh, you know, restaurant menu. You cannot put fifteen dollars for a pizza pie, a margarita, and then online you can put it for twenty dollars. It's not right. It's not right for your customers either. Uh, so there's there's no room for that wiggle. Um, all we ask is to, fairness. All we ask is for these third parties to understand how it is to run a business on a daily basis. Take it from an owner's perspective. You know, we, we work seven, six to seven days, 15 hours a day. Our employees, we're not trying to hurt. We're, our employees are our family because you're more than eight hours, eight hours a day, they become your family members. So <clears throat> to hurt small business, I feel like it's not right. I feel like it's a lot of against us. And all we try to do is feed our family and our employees' families. And uh, all I ask is for them to review all these uh, non-order calls, all these, you know, as you saw on the website too, you Google in the name, we're like pretty much on last on the list, and they get the profit. So all we want is to fix those issues. We love our deliveries. We love the modern, you know, obviously the technology takes control. We have nothing. We can't. We can't fight it. We have to go along with it. But there's some fairness that has to be done. Marcos, how long ago did you make the request for looking into those fees? Uh, one restaurant, we actually are able to look back further. So um, I'm still actually going through a lot of paperwork to to look those. But the one request that we did uh, was about uh, since I discovered this about a few months ago. And you haven't, have you followed up and they still haven't resolved or? Uh, resolved some some calls, we got our, our refund back, but I have never had a call or, or a follow-up call from, from their company. Now, you specifically mentioned the catering one. Mm -hmm. Were you able to get a refund? Do you feel that you're entitled to a refund on that? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that was because it was a customer that was calling you and yeah. placed an order for catering that shouldn't have gone through? Yeah, Rubble? because the was week that... before, they, they ordered a catering, uh, and she actually, like, ordered from us. We never got charged from a third party. Uh, the following week, she called, but she didn't have the number because um, uh, on she had to Google the restaurant number, and then we got charged $9 for that one. So, uh, as fairness, that shouldn't I shouldn't have nine dollars to come out of my pocket for someone to just to find a number for my restaurant. But do you have any charges that you're aware of that shouldn't besides that one that never yielded in a sales transaction? Uh, follow up calls like uh, we got to charge. Uh, sorry, um, a lot of a lot of like even like. When you go on a transaction list, there's like the they have the ID numbers, uh, the ones that have just the line through. Um, there's certain there's a lot of like I have no answers for them or I just have questions. Um, they just follow up with the call and then we got charged uh, also like four dollars and sixty cents for that, and just follow up calls. But there was so no it transaction. Placed, it, it placed an order. Which we got charged fifteen percent from, right? And then on the follow-up call, we got charged four sixties for. So that's more than fifteen percent. Did you get the four dollars and sixty cents back? No. So you were charged four dollars and sixty cents mm -hmm. for a phone call that did not yield in a sale. Exactly. 
and you brought that to their attention, and they did not refund it to you? Not yet, no. Not yet. We're going to stay in touch, Marcos. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah. You can turn that one. Right. Okay. Hi. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon. Thank you, Councilman Jonai, for having us here today. I want to thank you for holding the hearing to discuss this important issue. My name is Robert Guarino. I am one of the owners of New York City's own Five Napkin Burger. I'm also a board member of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. Five Napkin Burger is a full-service burger restaurant founded in Hell's Kitchen in 2008. We currently have four Manhattan locations and employ over 200 people. Uh, what I would like to focus on today is, is the part of uh, this whole scenario that scares me the most about our current reality. The early, movie, the early movers in tech figured out over the last 15 years that the big money wasn't in operating brick and mortar businesses or even in selling products. The big money comes from controlling all of the customer information and data. The Amazons and Open Tables and Grubhubs of the world figured out that the technology was the easy part. Once they created useful technologies, they were able to gain entry into restaurants or other businesses. Once inside, they were able to start vacuum, vacuuming up all of the data about our customers. They speed up this process by employing outsized digital marketing budgets on Google and Facebook ads to advertise directly to our customers. Once they, ha once they have the data, they earn the power to siphon margin from the businesses without even needing to sell a product. To, ex to explain clearly how powerful this is, think about it this way. I have customers who spend thousands of dollars with us whose names I do not know. While at the same time, Grubhub has all of the data about these guests and their history with my business. Whenever Grubhub likes, they can allow a competitor of mine willing to pay a higher fee access to my most valuable customers. With this information, the future will involve all of the delivery providers opening their own delivery only restaurants whenever they like, or in gouging restaurants desperate to keep their doors open. Uh, as an aside, um, th this is starting to happen. If you, if you uh, research a company called Deliveroo, uh, it's one of the bigger providers in Europe. They've opened brick and mortar businesses. There's articles that says Uber Eats is looking to buy them. Uh, it's, it's, it's part of the future. They're, with the data, knowing what customers like, knowing who the valuable customers are, um, as, as further growth is needed in the future to justify big valuations, it's, it, it, there's no doubt in my mind that it will, hap that it will happen. Um, as an entrepreneur, I'm a staunch believer in the value of the free market. I'm confident that my team is capable of creating a brand and a product that will allow us to survive in the years ahead. We have a size and scale and exposure that give us a fighting chance. However, I worry deeply about businesses smaller than ours who are, who are now in a position where they cannot be fi financially viable without using these services. These businesses are completely at the mercy of these companies to decide whether they live or die. As others will discuss today, there needs to be much more transparency in how the companies charge for their services. Additionally, they must do a fairer job of sharing customer data with the businesses they partner with. Both of these are areas where I believe local government can take steps to help level the playing field and to help protect the small businesses of our city. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Have you uh, been subject to any fees that are questionable? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm less focused on the, on the, on the um, call-in fees. I, I, I do think it's, it's um, uh, you know, it, it, it shows a good amount of bad will that they, now, now, that, this, now that this has been identified, that they're not just going back and refunding. I don't, I don't see how they're not going to be party to a class action lawsuit. Um, and if, like you suggested earlier, if they are truly partners, go back, do the right thing. I mean, what, what I heard today was that they have an algorithm that guesses with a certain degree of accuracy which call, how many calls uh, generated orders. That doesn't seem like a viable solution. It's a rounding error for a company that's worth $800 billion or whatever it is, uh, $650 million yesterday. No, excuse me, that would be me. They are $7 billion. Um, it's, it's a small number. Make it right. They have all the data to go back and refund all of those charges and put something more transparent in place. I think that would be a great show of goodwill. Um, but really, you know, a couple of the notes that I took as we were, as we were going through the day today. Um, 
I mean, certainly the algorithm uses, you know, you know, must. I'm, I'm sure that it must use uh, the rates that customers are paying. Uh, and the higher rates that generate more profitable orders, it has to, has to somehow be factored into placement. Um, popular restaurants with large order sizes and higher price points are the ones that generate the high paying customers. Uh, so it's one thing to have the data about the restaurants, they have the data about who the best customers are. And now to find more of those customers, if you've ever heard the term a lookalike audience, they, need, they have characteristics of those, of those audiences that allow them to market directly to other people who look like, who look like them, similar demographics, similar neighborhoods, similar, uh, you know, similar backgrounds, who are more likely to, spend, to be placing high orders in restaurants. That's how, that's how you know, the Amazons of the world market. They market to, directly to the best customers, and they have the data to do that. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Yeah. So, I want to thank you. Um, and have you, when you do a search on Five Napkins Burger, yeah. uh, does yours show up first or? Uh, no. I mean, so the other thing we didn't, you, you touched on when you were showing the screen shares is, you know, they, a lot of these companies, and not just Grubhub, but Uber Eats and also Open Table in the reservation world, they're placing ad words that say Five Napkin Burger Reservations or Five, they're, you know, they're spending ad money directly because they know that my businesses generate a lot of orders. Um, so it, it's, it's a little flippant to say, you know, very confidently that every order placed is incremental. Um, you know, we have very expensive Manhattan real estate for our four stores. We have a well-known brand. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, fortunately search for our product and start by searching for our product. And there's now a middleman between me and my customers in every vertical, reservations, delivery, menus, you name it. And so now I'm forced again to market back to my customers. And that's really the challenge that, I, that all of us are dealing with. And, and I, again, I, I think that these companies have, have played a service um, and, and they do, you know, they have, you know, generated a lot of volume. You know, it's also, I've also heard some flippant comments today about generating revenue. Uh, you know, revenue doesn't go to the bank, profits go to the bank at the end of the day. And it's, it's not the same thing. Um, you know, if I could just, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give a little. Well, I have a direct question. Yeah. We may be sharing this for more. What is your uh, profitability on the products so, that you sell? Is yeah, it so, within a percentage point of what? So I think the number was, I, I think the way we talked about numbers today was a little confusing. Um, so the example I wrote down here is let's just use a $20 item for, for round numbers. Generally, restaurants get to pay 30% for the cost of the food, 25 to 30%. So let's say that the $20 sale costs the restaurant $6 in food cost. Now they have $14 left to pay their labor, to pay their rent, to pay their utilities. Once they start paying 30% to a delivery provider, now they have $20 item, they pay $6 in food, they pay $6 to a delivery provider, and instead of having $14 left, they have $8 left now to pay the rent and pay the, pay the labor and pay the utilities. So the gross profit declined by 42% in that example. Um, and that's why, yes, we are generating I mean, a significant top line revenue with, with third party delivery providers. Um, but I have, I have restaurants that will pay more in third party delivery fees this year than they'll generate in bottom line profit. Um, fortunately, not all of them, but that's, that, that's the case. And you know, it's, it's, you know, we mentioned qu quickly, I don't think some of the uh, smaller operators and less sophisticated operators really understand the economics of what's at play here and really understand how vulnerable they are in the future. Um, you know, a brand like mine, now we, we have our own uh, ordering solution uh, directly on our website. Um, very inexpensive te technology nowadays. You could pay $150 a month to have your menu hosted online and receive an order just the way you do on Grubhub. The question is how you get, how you get, you know, how you make a user experience for, for your customers that's as good as Grubhub's, or how you acquire those customers. And to compete with public companies, you know, multinational public companies to do that uh, is, is not an easy task. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of the future. And, you know, just as far as data, like if, if you look at Open Table as an example, when somebody makes a res, they've, um, it's a whole, it's a whole nother hearing, but it's, uh, you know, when somebody makes a reservation on open table, 
which has been providing the reservation service to, re to the restaurant community for 20 years, there's a checkbox where the guest can opt in to receive marketing material directly from the restaurants. That's a huge difference than what happens in third-party delivery. Even something like that, I have no way to market back to the customers um, and to say, you know, to to send them any type of, uh, you know, any type of offers or or, or, or any type of marketing. Um, and you know, it's understandable why they don't want that because if I had that, I now that the technology has gotten cheaper, I wouldn't I wouldn't need to pay to be paying the percentage. But that's, you know, that, that, that's the challenge of where we are today. Um, you know, I don't think regulation is the key to solving every problem. But if, if there's a way that regulation can, can you know, you know uh, level the playing field and, and, uh, and help all of us, you know, compete and work together in a, in a more profitable fashion, I think that's good for communities and it's good for jobs and it's good for the future. Thank you. Thank You're you for welcome. your time. All right, well, my name is Isaiah Weprin, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Association for a Better New York. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the changing market for food delivery. As you may know, the Association for a Better New York is a 48-year-old civic organization that promotes the effective cooperation of public and private sectors to improve the quality of life for all New Yorkers. The food and restaurant industry are increasingly more important to the New York City economy, the Center for Urban Future recently cited that over the past 10 years is our second fastest growing industry, up 115,000 employees since 2009. Additionally, the number of restaurants in New York City has increased 1,574 between 2013 and 2017, according to the Department of Health's records. Not only are restaurants and bars an increasing employer of, of our food establishments, not only are restaurants and bars an increasing employer, our food establishments are a substantial draw and reason to come to New York City, with nearly a quarter of receipts at bars and restaurants coming from both domestic and international tourists. Therefore, we applaud the administration and the City Council for focusing on the issues surrounding the industry to ensure that these jobs, which are a critical part of the economic development ladder, are a sustainable and respectful means of employment. We also appreciate that the administration and the council strive to provide our city's small businesses, owners and managers, workers and customers with a sound and rational regulatory framework that is protective of New Yorkers while providing employers an opportunity to innovate and thrive. The oversight of, the, of food sector delivery apps, like other technologies in traditional New York sectors, has provided a significant level of disruption as well as a significant level of opportunity. The introduction of these services two decades ago, in many ways, leveled old playing fields of location, 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 driving the successes of businesses, particularly those with heavy proportion of deliveries and introduced new playing fields of ratings and visibility on the app itself. It has increased the ease of food delivery, which has affected the way restaurants are starting and growing in New York City. In a 2018 USA Today article, the NPD group quoted that New York City, over the last five years, revenue from deliveries jumped 20%, while the over number of deliveries increased 10%, indicating a more profitable growth model for restaurants that deliver. In the same article, Wesley Wobless, creator of Pinky Space, was quoted as saying, when we signed up with Grubhub, that changed everything for the business. Our first day online, our business tripled. With any level of growth this significant in a short period of time, we would expect that the demand market may change faster or slower than the supply chain, causing growing pains in an industry. And we applaud the City Council for shining a light on the issues to ensure a quick resolution. However, we urge the City Council to allow ample time and accommodations for the private sector partners to address the issues it spotlights. Prior to introducing any legislation or mandates that may fix a solution to a specific time or set of circumstances. Particularly in dash tech industries where tech companies will serve, will service traditionally strong sectors of the New York City economy, such as FinTech, Fashion Tech, or Food Tech, we want to maintain an inviting environment for companies to start here. The same Center for Urban Future Report sites that with the addition of 63,000 jobs to the New York City economy, 
tech is the fastest growing higher wage industry in New York City. Therefore, we hope that any discussions resulting from today would encourage economic development for all workers in our city. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. I want to thank you for your time. Is there anyone else that signed up to speak that has not spoken? Oh, we got one more. Okay, thank you. Will you please introduce yourself and who you're affiliated with? Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gregory Frank. Uh, I'm an attorney and an expert in antitrust and consumer law. Uh, I'm a partner at the law firm Frank LLP. Uh, unlike many others who have testified here today, I am not a stakeholder. Um, I've been asked by the committee to give testimony concerning the various antitrust implications of Grubhub's market power in the New York City marketplace. Um, our system assumes that fair competition between service providers benefits everyone. Competition lowers prices, fosters better consumer choice, encourages innovation, and rewards hard work. However, in highly concentrated marketplaces, Companies may use their market power to dominate the marketplace instead of competing fairly. This can lead to outsized and unfair prices, limited consumer choice, the restriction of fair competition, the debilitation of labor markets, and unsustainable prices that can drive downstream customers out of business. Evidence demonstrates that Grubhub has substantial monopoly power in the highly concentrated New York City online ordering marketplace. Grubhub's overwhelming market power in the New York City marketplace raises serious concerns from an antitrust perspective. The Federal Trade Commission uses a formula called the herfindahl hirschman Index, or HHI, to estimate when the concentration of market power in a marketplace is so dangerous as to be harmful to that marketplace. The FTC uses HHI when evaluating whether to block mergers. In essence, the FTC does not allow mergers in high HHI marketplaces because of the negative effects of a concentrated marketplace. HHI is calculated by squaring the percentage of the market share of each market player and adding them. Thus, for example, the HHI for a marketplace with 20 firms, each of whom has 5% of the marketplace, is 20 times 5 squared, or 20 times 25 for an HHI of 500. In order to understand the HHI scale, an HHI above 2500 is considered highly concentrated, leading to substantial regulatory scrutiny. A market with an HHI between 1500 and 2500 is considered moderately concentrated, and a market with an HHI below 1500 is considered unconcentrated. Furthermore, according to the FTC, a merger that results in highly concentrated markets that involve an increase in HHI of more than 200 will be presumed to likely enhance market power. In one case, an appeals court observed that an increase of HHI of 510 points, quote, creates a wide margin, a presumption that the merger will lessen competition. Just a few days ago, the data firm Second Measure posted evidence that Grubhub controls 69% of the New York City marketplace, Uber Eats controls 14% of the marketplace, and DoorDash controls 10%. Such a market concentration would indicate an HHI of over 5,000 for New York's online ordering marketplace. Even 5,000 is generous. Data provided by Restaurant Business Online last year indicates that Grubhub may have a market concentration in New York of almost 85%, which would mean an HHI of over 7,200. By way of comparison, the famous breakup of, H of AT&T um, had a pre-breakup HHI of about 8,000, and the FTC has not allowed the telecom marketplace to have an HHI above 3,000 ever since. 
Indeed, the Justice Department blocked the merger of AT&T and T-Mobile in 2001 because it would have resulted in a nationwide HHI of about 3,100, with an HHI above 2,500 in 96 of the largest 100 marketplaces. Among the dangers of a concentrated marketplace is outsized pricing power for market participants. Pricing power is the ability to raise prices without risk of losing business to competition. High pricing power exists in monopoly markets. High pricing power for monopolists places a heavy burden on both consumers and restaurants. The burdensome pricing power in the online ordering, online ordering marketplace in New York City is demonstrated by the testimony we've heard today. We have heard how the often 10 to 30% in fees harm modern restaurant economics, which involve inflexible budgets anchored by mostly fixed costs, such as food costs, labor costs, um, rent, and other utilities and overhead. Further, online customers are willing to pay the premium to participate in the online ordering marketplace, demonstrating what antitrust regulators call pricing power. As the Supreme Court has observed, quote, market power is the power to force a purchaser to do something that he would not do in a competitive market. It has been defined as the ability of a single seller to raise price. Lastly, I would like to draw attention um, to online ordering platforms, recent growth in market power in the physical ordering business. Grubhub's revenue model has been historically focused on its online digital platform, which connects customers and restaurants. However, in recent years, Grubhub has increased its market presence in the ancillary business of providing physical delivery services of restaurant delivery orders. The leveraging of Grubhub's online ordering near Monopoly in New York City into the separate product marketplace for physical delivery of orders creates other causes for concern. Reports indicate that Grubhub has grabbed substantial market share of the New York delivery market. Many of its customers use both the marketing and delivery services. Further investigation is merited to determine the effects on this labor marketplace and also the effects on the restaurant marketplace. Consolidation of the delivery labor market can result in depressed wages and fewer employment options for workers. Moreover, it can ultimately lead to less restaurant choice for consumers and other potential negative concerns. Um, those are my prepared remarks. Thank you. I want to thank you for that. This is all um, math that, or calculus, and I hated calculus. Please repeat that HHI 2500 is heavy concentration, and that would be a clear indication of an antitrust monopoly in the industry, is that? Okay, well, first thing to be clear is I want to distinguish between lawful and unlawful monopolies. Please. Um, I, uh, there exist lawful monopolies. If you build a better mousetrap and customers come to you, you know, you're, you gain monopoly power through lawful means. Um, and I have not uh, made any statements. I have not seen any evidence before me of, of any unlawful conduct. Um, but even lawful monopolies can have very negative effects on the marketplaces in which they exist. Um, in order to determine whether or not the market players in a marketplace have monopoly power, this HHI calculation is used. And my admittedly back of the envelope rough estimate demonstrates an HHI uh, as I mentioned, of, of potentially as high as 7,000, um, which based on recent evidence, you know, if, if companies were attempting to merge uh, at, at today's age in order to achieve that HHI, I, I don't believe the FTC would ever allow such a merger um, because uh, the HHI of the New York City online delivery marketplace indicates a very, very concentrated marketplace with substantial monopoly power um, to particularly the largest player, which is Grubhub. The number of 80% of the market is controlled, or Grubhub is 80% of all online orders through this platform. Where did you get that number from? Sure, I, I found that from um, an entity known as Restaurant Business Online, um, which provided that estimate about a year ago. 
Um, I, I don't have deep knowledge as to the, the uh, sources that they gain from that, where they gain that information. And the, the HHI measures or the merger, which is a 500 threshold, would be a clear indication of any concerns if there was additional mergers by these platform providers? Yes, exactly. Um, that in an existing concentrated marketplace, uh, there is a lot of concern with additional mergers or anything that could further concentrate the marketplace because uh, built into this HHI system is a presumption that it, it is automatically for some degree harmful to marketplaces to have an HHI above really 3,000 at this point um, because of the potential uh, unearned economic rents and other negative factors. Um, ultimately, pricing of power is correlated to market power more so than it's correlated to fairness or to the quality of your service. Um, it, it correlates to your ability to negotiate to get as high of a fee as you can get. And so with very highly concentrated market power comes the ability to gain really outsized fees that uh, oftentimes are not correlated to the service that is being provided. Mr. Gregory Frank, correct? Gregory, I want to thank you for your testimony. You've given me more to work on now to look into. And um, um, have you submitted your testimony in writing? Uh, I will. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Am I last? <laughs> last. Well, Reggie said two, two to four minutes, so we'll keep it at two. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was going to say the members of the, com the committee <laughs> um, uh, uh, for the invitation and opportunity to speak at this hearing. My name is James Chalkmock. I'm a technology analyst, writer, as well as a small business owner. Served as a technology analyst uh, for over 12 years, uh, working at multiple boutique investment brokerage firms in New York City, uh, analyzing and giving investment recommendations on consumer internet companies including ranging from Amazon and Google down to more niche entities such as OpenTable and Zillow. Uh, in this capacity, I was also closely involved in analyzing the major players in online food delivery, uh, both officially for the companies publicly traded like Grubhub, as well as unofficially for private entities uh, at the time, including Uber, Postmates, DoorDash, uh, among others. Uh, my opinions were distributed to investment firms as well as uh, distributed to media outlets, uh, both uh, television and print. Um, I continue to write uh, for a website called Techonomy uh, Media, uh, which basically helps um, its audience bridge the gap between what's happening in technology and the implications to society. Last year, I left my career in the securities industry to uh, start my own company uh, to co-found a company called Snails. We are an online service uh, and smartphone application for consumers to book uh, nail salons and uh, other beauty salons across New York. We have 300 salons on the platform uh, at the current time. Um, there's a lot of scrutiny into the industry um, and we are, our goal is to help raise the bar and reward the good actors and help consumers avoid the bad. Our business and services are not dissimilar uh, to the companies that we're here to talk about today. So I do, I am acutely aware of kind of the, the concerns uh, that come on uh, that uh, are communicated to us by the small business owners regarding models such as this. Uh, turning to the objective of the hearing, uh, the way I think about technology, it's to save people time. You know, in this instance, we're talking about two constituencies. You, you want to save time for the consumer that can order fo food from the home, order from the phone, and also save time by not running the risk of miscommunication of what the order should actually be. And obviously the restaurant saves time by getting access to consumers that they otherwise um, might not have been able to find on their own. But for this marketplace model, the middleman uh, to work, uh, both constituencies need to, to benefit. Now I will tell you as an investment analyst um, that um, there is, uh, as, especially for publicly traded companies, um, investors do demand to see consistent improvements in the commission rates and the, the take rates uh, that are um, extracted from uh, 
uh, the, uh, the entities served, in this case restaurants, uh, in order to continue to justify the investment. So there is pressure in that regard. Uh, these delivery platforms have done a phenomenal job to get to where we are today. Uh, I benefit from it myself. You know, the question today is, as the consumer benefits continue to build and accrue, um, are the restaurant benefits rising at the same rate uh, at which they have been? And um, I'd be ha happy to delve kind of further into that. I have some stats <laughs> I can share. If you have any questions or I can. Have you given us further elaboration in a written testimony? Uh, I haven't submitted the written testimony, but um, the, the way, the one thing I'd say is the, the way to think about it is, you know, we talk about monopolies and antitrust, um, but in reality, you know, delivery is still about 3% of all food orders uh, across the nation. Now, that number is probably 5x that for New York. You know, New York is a special, um, special place. Now, when you think historically, you know, the, the change in consumer patterns, 50 years ago, 85% of all food consumption was in grocery. Today, uh, and 15% and, uh, was restaurant. Today, that number is 50-50. It's further exacerbated by the adoption of the smartphone, and we have become a culture of con convenience and, and the, with this constant demand for uh, immediacy for virtually every aspect of our lives. Now, these companies can make money from three parts, right? They can make money from the consumer, charge the consumer. They can make money from the restaurant, charge the restaurant for in facilitating the transaction. They can also potentially extract commission rates from the tipping, uh, which we've seen, uh, I'm not sure for the companies today, but I have seen many reports of other companies. Now, the, the, the challenge is there's so much competition out there, which and it's virtually zero switching costs for us as the consumer to choose to order from one platform versus the other. You think about Uber versus Lyft, like when you're ordering a car. Um, you don't really care which platform you order the car from. You only care about the price and the proximity of the car that you're ordering from, which means that in order to differentiate themselves, these food delivery companies, it's very difficult to get your profit, get your revenue from the consumer, which means that you're going to have to rely the bulk of your revenue to extract that from the restaurant operator themselves. And, and that's why the cost burdens, um, you know, um, are, uh, make it difficult for these restaurant operators because if you think about it, a restaurant operator has, it, it's very difficult to predict on what the profit mix of your orders are going to be over time because you don't know what percentage of your orders are actually going to come on uh, from these uh, delivery services. Now, more predictable patterns can be, you know, if I had a, could employ a fixed fee model, you know, where I know exactly, you know, what I can, what, what, what these orders will ultimately cost me. Um, now, I wouldn't lump all of these companies into the same bucket because business practices do differ, um, but, it, you know, it's, it's something to be cognizant of. And the, the question I pose is to these companies is, you know, who really is your customer? Is the customer the person ordering the food, or is the customer the restaurant that's actually preparing the food? And, and it's that DNA, that philosophical kind of uh, approach and, and uh, to gauge you know, where the, the sentiments really lie. I guess the answer to that question is who's willing to pay more? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, uh, the, it's like I said, the, there's, so, there's so many options. I mean, you, you can order from any of these, uh, any of these companies, and which means that if I, if it makes it easy to order from any entity, it's got the burden has to fall on the restaurant. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I guess this concludes our hearing. Thank you.